Okay. I think we're rolling here. Got a fucking mess in the background as usual. Ugh. All right, so it looks like we got about three in here. So, yeah, for those of you that are watching, chime in. Let me know if you can hear me, you can see me, smell me. If you can smell me, something's going wrong. And I listed this pretty late tonight, so it's going to probably take a while to get some viewers in. Garrett's in. Hey, Garrett. Good evening. I assume everything's coming through on your end good. Jeremy's in. JH is in. He can't smell me, so I guess we're doing good. <laughs> All right, looks like there's probably some lag here on the chat. George Gooding says we're good. Garrett says we're good. All right. So, yeah, I was sitting down. <clears throat> I looked at my schedule and realized it's Thursday night. I probably should do a holster chat, even though there's not a lot to update on, and I don't know what Dolly's into. Um. I did, and then I finally remembered. So <laughs> I was going to list all the holsters that I got in stock. Um, I was going to list them this past Sunday. I forgot. And uh, one of the ones that I did have listed sold this or this afternoon, and then I remembered. So I just got them all listed. I just finished doing that uh, with the exception of one because I didn't have pictures for it. Um, got them all listed uh, on Etsy. Uh, so go on over there and uh, see if uh, um, see if there's anything you like over there. But anyways, yeah, it's probably going to be a slow chat tonight here. Things I <laughs> well, I listed last week's last minute too, and people showed up about the middle of it. Um, so uh, we might be able to get a few more in here a little bit later on. But, yeah, I just thought I'd got to let everybody know what's going on. Um, for those of you that uh, saw the listing before we went live, notice that nice picture of that uh, Schofield holster. That was uh, the one that uh, 11 Bang Bang Channel bought. And they did a little review on it if you're uh, inclined to go over and take a look. And it was a hilarious video. I've watched it probably five or six times because, um, I mean, it is hilarious. Oh, it, uh, yeah, I, I laughed my butt off at that one. One of the funniest videos I've seen for a while. And the thing is, their filming studio, they was able to set up to where it looks uh, just like a little gun store, too. Now, there's... Eleven Bang Bang Channel itself. Yeah, we were just just mentioning the review you guys did over there. Um, if y'all want to throw a link up to that, that'd be fine. Um, I thought I was going to do that. I was going to put that down on the bottom of the description box here, and I plum forgot to do that. But yeah, that was a. I, I enjoyed watching that video. That was good. Let's see, I got things blinging at me here. Uh, Scott, how you doing? Looks like we got some folks rolling in here. Todd B's rolling in. All right. It, it might seem like I'm a little bit thirsty tonight. I ran out of my drinking water. Because I don't like drinking the tap water because one, it tastes like crap. And 
too. They've got so much chemicals and stuff in it that I don't like uh, drinking it. So I haven't been drinking a lot of water today. Went to the bathroom and realized how much I hadn't been drinking. So I ran over to Granny's place because she had ice and she had tea mix. I can down the tap water around here if I put some tea in it and get it cold. So I'm going to see if I can catch up on hydrating today. Very important to keep yourself hydrated. Yeah, Todd, iced tea, but it's just that Limpton quick mix stuff. I like the cold brew. I really like, you know, just regular hot brew that you put ice in, but uh, I didn't feel like brewing that tonight. I can tell as fast as I'm drinking. I'm pretty dehydrated down today. Change. <laughs> Yeah, smell vision on that one. Yeah, yeah. And if I did that and had smell of vision, everybody would be saying, put your damn arms down. I haven't had a chance to hit the shower for a couple days. Sky grabbed a 49 pocket this afternoon. Awesome. Yeah, I seen Midway had them in, but yeah, I just can't justify spending that kind of money right now. Not when I'm getting ready to move. I've got to see the eye doctor here pretty soon. Um I'm on my last set of contacts, and they didn't told me they're not going to let me renew until I come in and see them because I'm two years over. So I got to, that'll run me probably 500 bucks. Um, it, uh, yeah, so I uh, I was thinking about getting one of the, the Wells Fargo model ones without the loading lever on it. Bang's my uh, one that I had that was an Army San Marco. I went to crap, and I can't get a mainspring for it. But, uh, yeah, if you're looking for a holster, Scott, I've got this style, which I've got a few finials for. Um, fortunately, they're not the traditional style. They're screwbacks, and I'm not very happy with that, but that was what the company had. And things they didn't call me back. I assume they don't have any more in stock. Um, the uh, other style I've got, and I'm going to show this one off a little early. This was going to be a, one of those surprise ones, but... I've been playing around some more with spots. I ordered some copper ones in, and I ordered in a uh, little bit bigger one. And so I uh, threw one together, and I should have uh, checked on my pattern a little bit, um, did some pre-planning before I started setting spots, because I actually tried this twice. I screwed up the first one real horrible. second one isn't perfect, but it's better. Uh, but I did some real dumbass mistakes. But... Uh, there's this one. I couldn't get this spot in up here because the one on the, the little cross here didn't line up. Now, these are all antique copper. I got one half inch in there, which then things are kind of spendy in the copper. And then it's got the smaller quarter inch coppers all the way around. Um, but when I went to do this straight line, because I wanted to get the line straight, I thought, yeah, I'm going to, you know, I'll just take my awl, you know, because they use a scratch awl to mark the leather. And I thought I'll just go real light down the thing. I used my diamond doll, and that thing is so damn sharp, it split the leather. That was a boneheaded move right there, I guarantee it. And then uh, this leather was towards the edge there, and it was a little bit softer. And when I set these, it kind of uh, distorted the length of the leather. But I think when I sew it up and when I get it dyed, I think I can pull it off. That and I had dirty hands when I was working this little dirt gun on the leather. And then there's this atrocity that I really screwed up on. Tried to eyeball it, and as you can see, things went wild. So, I don't know if I'll bother putting that one for sale, or I'll see if I can cut some toe plugs out of it. But, uh, that one, uh, I, don't know. I don't really want to put that for sale. But, yeah, I, uh, currently I don't, I'm not making any holsters except for I've got two I got to finish sewing up for a uh, couple um, for the 11 bang bang guys they got a couple here I got to finish sewing up for them and uh, I got to put a toe plug in that other fancy holster um, that I stitched up and kind of screwed up on and I'm getting blings on my phone again um, we finished putting a toe plug in that. I got to put a toe plug in 1911 holster. Um, let's see. Todd B. Opinion on El Paso holsters. Um, my uncle has one. 
for a 1911, it's a pancake outside the waistband style. He paid more for it than I would charge for any one of my holsters. That's just plain. Um, and I wasn't impressed. He wasn't impressed. It was better than the other one he bought. He bought two of them. So the first one he bought, he paid, I don't know, 80, 90 bucks for. And that piece of crap is huge. I mean, for a holster for uh, 1911, that was a big holster. Um, then uh, he bought that El Paso one. And it's not terrible. But for the amount of money he paid to get it, um, just my opinion, I think it was overpriced. Um, and when they soaked it in oil, I mean, they, they soaked that thing in oil. You squeeze that hard enough and it leaks oil out everywhere. But that's the only El Paso holster I've had uh, um, any experience with. Could be we just got one that was bad. It took like four months for it to show up when he ordered it. But that was back during the panic buying of 2012 and 2013. So it was, uh, might've been rushed. I don't know. That's the only experience I've got. That's all I can say. Um, but yeah, just, just kind of feel out there and see what other people have to say, but that's my experience with them. I do know I looked at them. They do have a nice set of, uh, pommel bags that I looked at, uh, that are kind of in the style that I'm looking to make here, uh, for myself, but the price tag on them was, a hell of a lot higher than I wanted to pay. And if price tag's too high for me to pay for something when I have the skill set to make it on my own, I'm not going to buy it. Now, Ryan says, and wait a long time. I suppose he means that that applies to the El Pasos, which I can't say too much about waiting a long time because I've made people wait quite a long time long enough that they never responded back but now that's not on them that's on me but i've been tooling away like i said i got a couple holsters here i gotta finish up um oh uh santee's got one there um sounds like he's got about the same issue four month wait couldn't draw it well, that's one thing on my holsters. Depending on which one you order, some of them are a little bit tight. Um, that's one reason why I don't line, offer lined holsters. Um, is, uh, you know, they get pretty tight on, on the draw. That one that I made for myself is terrible. Uh, that fancy one for the draw, but it's kind of a show holster anyway. Um Arizona Ghost Rider says my holsters rock. So there's one good opinion on them. Um, but yeah, they my holsters, a lot of them will come a little bit tight, but you set a gun in them for a while and they'll they'll loosen up a bit on them. Yeah, Arizona, you should uh, Santee, you should show that holster sometime. If you told me you put a little walnut stain on it, and I'd love to see it. I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, Sasha, my barracks do look messy because I'm getting ready to move here and things are getting moved around. And uh, I uh, need to uh, kind of get organized here. But yeah, being as I'm getting ready to move here in about a month. And things are messy anyways because everything just kind of rotates around my house. But uh, my organizational skills aren't that great. Um, Arizona, I haven't started the new gig yet. Um, I start the 25th of April. And from the sounds of it, might be starting off with mountain howitzer training right off the bat. So I'm going to get to fire a big cannon. <laughs> I get to fire the big guns. Yeah, Sasha, I, I don't, I try not to tell people. 
where exactly I live at. And the address I use for shipping on all my holsters is not my actual address. It is a relative's address, which is the address I use because that's kind of where I base my operations on being as I move around a lot. Yeah, there's on, I think, I can't remember if he said it was a 6 or 12 pound mountain howitzer, but it's a big freaking cannon. Fortunately, we don't get to shoot live rounds, but still the blanks out of that are awesome. Redneck Wookie's on board. How we doing? And, uh, you know, anybody um, anybody that uh, I, I don't get right to your comments right at the beginning, don't take it personal, but sometimes these things move faster than I can read them. Yeah, I've seen something that Scott had one earlier. I was going to try to read here, and I missed it. So let me go back here. Hey, Garrett had a opinion on El Paso. <laughs> so from from what everybody's saying, El Paso probably isn't um, first choice. I can tell you a little bit about the Triple K. Um, cause I've bought several triple K holsters from Cabela's and for 30 bucks are not bad. Um, but it's kind of one of those things you get what you pay for. Um, they're not terrible, but they're not top of the line either. I mean, they'll get you by, but they, uh, I bought a Walker holster from them in which I found completely unusable because it's a straight draw and you got to come all the way up here to get the Walker out. Um, the, uh, I had one for the 51, my first one, my 51 Navy, uh, Confederate 44. And that one, uh, wasn't terrible. Um, I wound up using it for a pattern. I cut it up and used it for a pattern, but, uh, the, uh, the holster itself, it wasn't terrible. I, I mean, it's not, wasn't historical. It, it had a snap and everything on it. And I bought a couple of the Hickok holsters. And they weren't bad either. <coughs> Excuse me. They weren't terrible. Um, I, uh, you could definitely find something better online, but I mean, for the money, if you're, if you've got a very tight budget, they're a viable option. Um, but you're not going to get the quality like what you get from me or, or, or some of the other guys. Um, and even with me, you're not going to get the quality that you get from somebody like David Carrico, who's been doing this for years and has the tools and machinery to turn out a beautiful piece of art. Um, as one person told me, uh, mine's kind of borderline between art and, and utilitarian holster. So, but, you know, I try to try to make a point of keeping my stuff under 100 bucks so that it's in the affordable range. Sometimes that's... They, they get close to that 100 mark, but I try to keep them under that as much as possible. Yeah, Santi, that's one thing I got against the uh, Triple Ks as well, is they have a lot of oil in them, just like the El Paso Saddlery. I think they have a little pail there with neat spit oil, and they just dip it in, and that's how they do it. Guns of the West is here. Howdy, Dustin. Okay. Um so I was going to highlight this one. So Scott's looking at a uh, uh, shoulder for the 49. Uh, be in the market for a Dragoon holster in a month. Yeah. Um, so I better address um, holster making and stuff coming up here. So I did order leather uh, from Springfield Leather Company. Um, got me some Herman Oak. So we're going to be going up in quality of leather here. Um and that was all thanks to all you that, that placed orders here um, at the 1st of March. Uh, you made that possible for me. Thank you all for doing business and bringing business to me. Um, anyway, um, I got that leather. I just got notice that it shipped today. Um, so they, I guess they was on back order. Um, so they didn't ship last week when I ordered, but they, they did ship today. Should be here by the end of the week. It's going to give me one week to get some stuff done and then things are going to kind of get hectic because the week of the 11th turkey season comes on 
and I don't care how many orders I get, you're not stopping me from going turkey hunting with my dad. That's something that we enjoy doing. Um, ever since we went on our first turkey hunt a year and a half ago, um, we go every year. Um, so turkey season, I've got one week to do it this year. <laughs> I've got one week to get it done. Maybe a little more, but I've got one week for sure. Um, so that's coming up. So after when I get started with turkey hunting, if I tag out the first day on both my tags and dad tags out on the first day or second day, you know, we tag out early. Yeah, I'll have time to do holsters, but, you know, I'm going to focus on hunting until I get a bird or two and dad gets a bird. Um, and then the week after that, I've got to be heading to uh, Wyoming and probably somewhere in those two weeks, I'm going to have to be finding a place to live in Wyoming. Yeah, I don't know why YouTube held that back, Garrett, but I showed it. Anyway, um, uh, yeah, I got to be finding housing. I'm going to be packing up to get moved up there. I start work on the 25th and the way the government, uh, pay schedule rolls out, um, I won't have a paycheck for a month. So when you figure in, I'm going to have to pay a security deposit, one month's rent in advance, um, take care of my other bills that I got to take care of, go to the eye doctor. Yeah, I've got a, I ain't got a lot of time to get the hunting and stuff done. So I kind of got to get things rolling, but same time, it'd be nice to get some holster sold in there. So I have a little extra. Arizona signing off. We'll see you later, Santee. Take it easy. Yeah, don't forget to show you that holster sometime. Um, so, yeah, at uh, next couple weeks here, uh, like I said, next week, been off when the leather shows up, I'm going to try to get as much done as I can, get some stuff made. Then after that, once I get up there in Wyoming, um, I'm going to be rele relegated to doing holsters on what time I have. Bangs, I'm going to be, you know, not doing a lot of things. It takes a while to get a paycheck. Uh, I'll probably be making holsters on my days off, but uh, yeah. Um, let's just say if you place an order with me after May 1st, expect a long turnaround. All right. Plowboy's here. Hey, Plowboy, you showed up early this time. <laughs> We're only a half hour in. Let's see. Oh, probably had one earlier too there. I'm thinking about, uh, let's see if I can find that. Thinking about uh, my next leather purchase will be a double hook up a berry type setup. That would be a cool setup. Um, I'm going to have a new Schofield model coming out here shortly uh, when I get the new leather in because uh, the boys over at 11 Bang Bang was wanting uh, kind of a Jesse James style rig. Which I don't think that's going to be too hard to, to turn out. I just got to take the uh, um, just take the model that I made for the triple loop the body and just take the skirt off of it, and uh, I got it made. Plowboy in between tornadoes. Oh god, yeah, I heard they was having tornadoes down there. Uh, Plowboy, I sure hope that they don't come towards you. It's uh. Crazy weather this year, but now I'm hoping that the weather in this part of the country is a lot more wet than it was last year because our lakes are low. Um, speaking of lakes, that was the other thing I did this week. I took a day and went with Dad and we went fishing. Uh, we was getting bites, but nothing was really connecting good. Uh, I think it was walleye just kind of smacking the lures around. Talked with a couple of guys that was fishing there, and they said, you know, the catfish were biting good the week before, and there were a few walleye starting to bite. Uh, but crappie and stuff haven't started yet. But uh, after the first of April, I got to buy a new license. So I don't know if I'm gonna do too much fishing. Um, let's see. Somebody back here said something about getting a turkey with some breasts. I think that was that was Garrett. I don't know where it went. Because the chat moves around on me. Uh, 
Redneck Wookie says, I might be getting a 410 Smith & Wesson revolver or 38. Would you be able to make me a holster? Uh, depends on the size. Now, if you're talking a 38, like the 586 model, it's about the same as the Taurus 856. I might be able to swing something there. Um, as for uh, the 410, I just don't make holsters for the modern guns because I don't get that many requests for them. And um, like the Schofield, the only reason I started that up is because I had enough interest in there to justify me buying a mold. If I had enough interest in some of the modern ones um, to buy a mold, I would do so. But I just don't have that much interest right now. Um, but yes, if, if it's a uh, um, 586 model, Smith & Wesson, whatever frame that is, um, one of those smaller ones, I can probably swing something with that, one of those little snub noses. Garrett, yeah, I knew as you said that, Garrett. I just can't find it in the chat anywhere. Um, I thought about taking a turkey with my brown best, but the area we hunt, um, the guy's got a lot of dry vegetation because um, there's a, there's a, it used to be a little farm ground there, and there's a lot of weeds that have moved in. So I just uh, don't uh, like the idea of throwing sparks around. That best throws some pretty bad sparks, especially when you're using that 1F powder. Um, and I haven't played around with trying um, the shot loads. In fact, I don't even know if I've got any number four shot. I've got number seven and a half shot, I think. Um, so, yeah, I just haven't, I haven't really thought much about doing the best. I might do a best in the fall if I got snow on the ground. Because in the fall, you can use a solid ball. In the spring, you're relegated to just shot. Uh, JH says uh, the 586 is a K-frame. So if you got a short barrel K-frame, I could probably make you something work there. Um, JH says he's been ducking tornadoes. God, I feel for you guys down there. Tornadoes are a scary thing. Um, yeah, my, I got two chats going, and they're going faster than I can read them. <laughs> which is good. That means a lot of you are in here and you're interested in paying attention. And that's what we want. Um, Casey Scott, uh, the mold I got for the Schofield, I ordered it through Etsy. Uh, I can't remember um, if Nick shows up here. He can, I think it's bunkhouse tooling is uh, the one I got it through. Um, another company I looked at, I can't remember the name of it. They had aluminum mold blocks, but you're talking Anything under a seven inch barrel they had, you could get for like $55, $60. Anything over that was $75. And, uh, you know, I, I, I would prefer to have the aluminum block molds. But uh, at that price rate, um, it's going to be a while. Uh, I talked with another um, guy that I'd, I'd sold some holsters to about uh, 3D printing. Uh, Schofield model for me. Um, I haven't heard back from him yet. He was going to look into doing that. Um, so um, I might have an avenue there for uh, for uh, some molds. But uh, right now, yeah, I just got that one, which is just a it's a resin cast is all it is. Um, see, Guns of West says funny that. Uh, I mentioned uh, Brown Best was mentioned. He just watched the old Brown Best video for the first time this afternoon. Yeah, those videos were fun. That one, I did the one where I couldn't hit the broadside of a barn with it. I was using a 615 ball patched. And then I did another video with that thing and I patched a 715 ball. And Jesus, I mean, that thing was shooting a group like that at 50 yards, which is pretty good for a smoothbore. And it's amazing how much accuracy a smoothbore gets. The Brown Best gets some uh, bad rap because. The British were using a 20 gauge, yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, 20 gauge round ball inside of an 11 gauge bore. That was so they could keep loading as the gun fouled. And, you know, you get that small ball just kind of going whatever way down the barrel, it loses accuracy fast. Um, you tighten that up to where that gas is centering that ball coming out of the bore, and you'd be surprised the accuracy that thing will get. I've read some accounts where um, Hudson Bay. Employees of the Hudson Bay Company up in, you know, um, I'll say it's Fort Hall, 
is either is one of those up there, Montana, Idaho, Oregon, up in that part of the country. They talked about having a Christmas celebration and the employees were allowed a day of leisure. And one of the uh, um, ways of entertaining themselves is they'd shoot buckets filled with ice, uh, frozen buckets. And, you know, they would hit them with the brown best muskets at 150 and 200 yards. And to do that, you are not using a military load. You are probably using a very tight patch or a very tight fitting bare ball. Um, I've used a 735. I haven't done it in the video. Um, I've used a 735 and it. It gets surprising accuracy out of that gun. Uh, let's see, Nafuzi says, I need a 500 Smith & Wesson Magnum holster mold, but I've looked everywhere. Apparently, that's a thing you need to know a guy with a 3D printer for. Um, God, I wish I remembered um, who the guy was, uh, but I went online and I looked this one up. You got to download his list, and you can't read everything on there, but I think he's got uh, Smith & Wesson 500. I had a guy ask me for a Smith & Wesson 500 holster, and I told him, I said, you're the only one that... Uh, um, you're the only one that had asked me for one. So, you know, I couldn't really justify the means of buying the mold when the mold is going to cost as much as the holster. Now, if I get orders for three or four holsters about, you know, same time period, then I'll consider doing it because, you know, I'm still going to be making a profit off of that one model. But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, um, that they're out there. You just got to look. Um, let's see, Ryan Duke, Willow, Remington, 1875 and 1890 fit and cap and ball holsters. Um, they'll fit in anything that'll fit a 73 single action that I've got. Um, oh, where, oh, where did my triple loop go? Okay. So this one, I have put a 75 single action in and they fit like a glove. They fit just as good as a Colt. And I think that's because, um, I left the body a little bit wide. I think on the original, it was a little bit narrower. I left the body a little wide on this model, so it will fit. Also, uh, the new Schofield holster, the triple loops, I forgot to mention that. They'll fit a Colt single action army too, so they are good for both. So if you want to order one for both of them, order the Schofield model. Um, the only difference between it and this one is that I have to widen the trigger guard, um, the area for the trigger guard a little bit because, you know, the, the Smith & Wesson is a little taller. Then I had to cut the notch here deeper so that if you're putting a Schofield in it, you're not having the problem of it flying open. Um, and also, if you're shooting that uh, new model number three um, that uh, Cimarron recently brought to the market, that sight sits a little bit further forward, so it won't hang up. The sight won't hang up on the holster. So that one's actually good for all the full-size uh the Smith & Wesson break actions, the big ones. If I'm sorry if I sound a little bit nasally, but my nose is stuffed up here. My God, it's springtime. That's all I can say. And Granny had a cold, and my niece has had a cold, so I'm probably coming down with it too. Uh, Casey Scott says, uh, I didn't hear back from Dylan on an aluminum mold. I think that was one of the ones I looked at. They didn't have much in stock for what I wanted. They had a lot of the newer model stuff, but they didn't have the uh, the older stuff. Um, Road King, I want a Paladin holster and belt. That would be cool. Um, that's not something I offer because that's kind of a Buscadero style. I It's not that I can't make a Buscadero, but I tend to go more towards the actual historical stuff. And uh, that, and if you do the the holster with the the Buscaderos, you got to you pretty much got to offer a belt with them too. And I don't do belts, um, but that would definitely be a cool holster. I like that. And then the silver horse that goes on, or not the horse, the uh, it's the chest piece. Isn't it? It's the silver chest piece. Um, that would probably be a little spendy to find. Um, Let's see. Yeah, if it's, it's not a bad idea to get more options uh, for molds in the shop, but being the, the amount of business that I do, um, I just can't justify 
buying all those molds just yet. One of these days when I have a big shop and I'm doing lots of orders and, you know, I can probably start offering more of the modern stuff and maybe do some of the Buscaderos. But right now I just kind of focus on the historical stuff and, and just do what I can. And like I said, Smith and Wesson, that's one I've, that's a holster I've wanted to do for a long time. And I want to get my hands on Smith and Wesson. I really, 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 really like that new model number for three. Um, that Cimarron's got, but, uh, just can't justify swinging it yet. Um, I just, I, I like doing the historical stuff. It's fun. I was thinking about starting again and trying to do some of the turn of the century, which is starting to lean into the Buscadero style. Um, there's one in there that's made by uh, R.T. Frazier. So the Frazier holsters that were historical made towards the end of the 1800s. And R.T. Frazier didn't just make holsters. He was also a saddler. Uh, if you've heard of a Frazier saddle, that's, that's probably an R.T. Frazier out of Pueblo, Colorado, which is just up the road a little ways. Um, I was looking through Packing Iron, and they had one in there that I would love to try to reproduce. It's a very, very beautiful holster, but... Uh, I just haven't done it yet. One of the big things that, that keeps me from making a holster um, is, you know, the, the whatever I use to make a particular holster, if I don't think it's going to sell very good, you know, and then I'm sitting on it for a while and I, I don't make a lot that I hang on to um, just because I wind up selling everything. But I've got three holsters here that I'm going to be hanging on to, so I need to start hanging on to the good looking stuff so I can sell more in person. Casey Scott Duncan, not Dylan. Oh, okay. We got you. Got you. Um, if Uzi says it's stupid how much some holsters mold sell for, the resin mold for a 357 Python is like $50. And I just got a cheap UK Arms Air Soft Python replica for like $20. Yeah, and <laughs> DNX, I know there's a lot of holster guys who use the DNX replicas and they're good, um, but there are some of them that aren't real great. Um, so you just kind of got to pay attention and, and know what the dimensions are and see how close they line up. What are you doing, Doofy? Oh, you bumped your head on the table. My pup here is trying to get my attention. They think they need to be fed. I got one here laying by the bowl trying to hint, hint at me that she needs fed, but they can wait a little bit. I guarantee you they've been finding stuff in the yard to eat all day. Um, Alan says he loves his holster. I'm glad to hear that, Alan. <laughs> so Alan got one that was kind of a um, a custom one. It's got a double belt loop, so it's kind of like a cross between a pancake and your traditional style um, civilian flap that I sell, a little shorter model. And... Uh, yeah, that was that was a, what I was <laughs> dreading making that one because I thought, God, I hate for this one to turn out wrong, and you know, it basically it was a prototype. When I got done with it, it just was beautiful. There's a couple things I would change on it, but that was that was a fun one to work on. It was, I really enjoyed that one, and I was really surprised at the comfort on it when I tried it on because I wore it around for a day. And that was a comfortable holster. <laughs> um. Oh, wow, Nafuzi, yeah, the shotgun scabbard for attack 14, that would be, that's a, that'd be cool. Did you tool that one? I bought, because uh, I've got one like that, and I just bought one of the canvas ones that had the molly straps on it, because I wanted to attach it to a backpack, and then, you know, it made the backpack completely freaking ridiculous heavy. Um, So I wound up taking it off of there, but... uh Plowboy said, I backed away from that uh, Spencer as a stimulus purchase. Picked up a new 30-inch Uberti 1885 high wall 4570. That's not bad. Personally, I would have went with the uh, uh, Spencer, but yeah, high wall is a good one. I've heard good things about them high walls. You know, Doofy, I just piled them socks up. My Doofy dog. So, my older dog. I can put the laundry, the dirty laundry, in a basket. And I've got the basket set by the chair, so I remember to take it over and, and do laundry in the morning. 
And this doofy dog loves to lay on my socks. So she spills the laundry, breaks the socks out, makes them into a nice nest and lays on them on the floor. So I get to pick them up in the morning again. Gotta love our pets. <laughs> um, let's see. Jeremy said something. Um, tour between 3030 and 308. Any thoughts? Um, if you're planking, 3030. Uh, if you're wanting to hunt elk, 308. Um, if you're hunting just deer, either one will do it. Um, 3030 and 308. Last I checked, the animal goes for about the same price when you can find it. Um, both of them shoot about the same weight of bullet between 150 and 170 is what I always put through a 3030. Um, 3030, of course, you got the, the flat nose bullets. Um, but yeah, I, I enjoy 3030. I shot a 308 a time or two, and you know, it's not bad, but I like my 6.5, which is just the neck down 308, basically. Uh, it gets a little bit better accuracy at longer range, but. I don't know. Um, the 3030, you can get a lever action. 308, you're not going to find an old style lever action. That's for sure. Oh. And the fizzy, that sounds like cool. A cool, cool project. If you got any pictures to it, send it to me. Uh, send it to the email. In fact, I need to put that up here. I need to throw the banner up. Um, there it is. So if you want to order, but yeah, if you want to send a picture to that, uh, Nefusi, I'd love to see that if you've got one. That that sounds like a cool project. Yeah, J H says three hundred eight for hunting, thirty thirty for fun. I would use a 30-30 for deer hunting uh, if I could get a deer within 100 yards. Um, when I was hunting whitetails um, last fall, uh, the one area that I was hunting in, I took the 6.5, but I would have gladly taken that 30-30. The only problem I got with my Winchester is it shoots a mile high at 100 yards. Um, the zero on that, and the, the elevator on the rear sight is gone. Dad took that off, and it still shoots. 20 inches high at 100. Um, but uh, if I could get that to where it was shot a little closer, point aim, man, I'd love to go hunting with that one. I've got a Marlin 336 too that my dad uses because we can put a scope on that. But I think his big game hunting days are just about done unless I can find some place where I can set up a blind for him while I hunt out of a blind. Um, his. Uh, he can he, he has trouble getting around anymore. Pretty much all we do is duck hunt and uh, turkey hunt because you can sit in the blind. Um, yeah, and the fizzy out work too. Yeah, send the Instagram um, uh, link to it. That would work just good. Like I said, I just like to see what it looks like. That sounds cool. Yeah, JH, <laughs> when I first started loading 3030, I bought some cast bullets because I could get 500 for the price of what you get, like 50 of the, the higher end ones that they had online at the time. So I ordered them. Totally new to hand loading. Don't know much about loading the smokeless. You know, I had loaded black powder loads uh, before for 4440, 45 Colt. So I. Uh, had just gotten into reloading for uh, 223 as well. So I bought a pound of Vargit. Uh, I, I got a pound of Vargit. I'm going to see if they've got a recipe for 3030. Sure enough, they had a Vargit recipe. And uh, I looked it up and I found the bullet weight. And it said, you know, go this much. And I thought, all right, I'm going to try that. So I started, I loaded some up, I took it to the range and started shooting. And I mean, first shot was dead center. And I thought, all right, this is loaded likes. Second shot, dead center. Third shot, kind of walked off a little bit. Fourth shot was over here. Fifth shot was over here. Sixth, I mean, it went to hell. We looked at the bore of that gun and you could take your finger and just, you know, wipe the lead dust off. And then I realized, oh, hand cast lead. 
that's too hot of a load. So I went back and did some more research to find out what I should have been loading with it. And that's when I discovered the H4, I don't remember which one it was. Um, but it was uh, one of the Hodgdon's um, 4895, I want to say. Don't quote me on that. Uh, but I found a load on that, you know, that kept it down low. And uh, I started shooting that, and I did not have any leading. Um, no leading problems at all. And the accuracy on it wasn't terrible at 50 yards, but, you know, compared to the store-bought rounds, the recoil was not all that. I mean, it was like shooting a 38 Special through a rifle. It was it was a pleasurable plinking load. But I would not load those bullets for hunting. Those would be plinking loads. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Scott says, I live in North Dakota. I've seen a lot of bison. I see why they use those big calibers. Yeah. So, doing living history, I've had the pleasure of handling a hide that come off of a bison fresh. And when you start getting up around the hump, that skin is like that thick. And you cannot get a razor blade through to go through that. That skin is so tough. We pegged that thing out on the ground to scrape it. Um, we wasn't going to make it into a robe because the hair was crap. But we was trying to skin it down, thin it down to brain tan. And uh, when we went to peg that SOB, we was trying to cut the holes in every knife we had. We didn't, couldn't get a knife sharp enough to cut it. What we found up, finally wound up doing was putting a piece of wood under it. And then we'd take a skinny knife, take a log and hit the back of that knife and drive it through. And once you pushed it through, it would go through. It would not cut. So, yeah, they use those big calibers to punch through because them buffalo were. And, you know, one thing they found out right quick on hunting buffalo, if you can get a double lung, a buffalo will drop pretty much in its tracks. Um, but you got to get it through both lungs. So. Sometimes, um, you know, there's accounts of it passing through one lung and that being enough to collapse both lungs. That was probably with the bigger calibers. But, uh, and the other thing is buffalo, they have good sense of smell. Not such a good eyesight. But they, they, the sound of the guns booming. And black powder has a different crack to it than a, a modern rifle. So you set a guy up with a sharps or a rolling block, 4590, 45110 at four or five hundred yards. That's gonna be kind of a roar, just kind of <laughs> doesn't really get the buffalo stirred up all that much. And that's why they was able to slaughter you know 20 or 30 at a time. You just started to pick the lead animal, you drop them. When the animals start to move, you drop whatever one's furthest out, and you just kind of keep keep them going in this little area, and then pretty soon you drop a whole bunch. Eventually, the animals would get wise, and they'd all take off. Um, but I've read some accounts of them guys dropping 20 or 30 buffalo at a time. And one guy I was reading an account on, you know, he dropped 30 buffalo, but he only had one skinner with him. And, uh, you know, they talked about they were skinning clear until dark and fighting the wolves off because the wolves would tear the hides up. Um Hunting buffalo, that was definitely a business that you had to learn and know what you were doing. And that's why a lot of them, you know, they have a designated shooter, you hire skinners, hire camp cook if you're a big operation. Yeah, and, if it's, and, and it depends on the 4570 you're loading. Now, you load one of them that are designed for the Marlin guns, some of the more modern ones. Holy crap, them 4570s are pushing out like a 458 lot. I don't know if they're going quite that fast, but, I mean, they've got heavy recoil, 300-grain bullet. All I know is you put that in my sharps, and you're probably going to blow my sharps up with some of them. 
Yeah, Scott, I've always wanted to go to Teddy Roosevelt National Park, but North Dakota is kind of way up there from where I'm at. Um, I also had looked into, and I may do it in the future, uh, working at uh, Fort Union National Historic Site, which is up there along the North Dakota-Montana border. Um, if you're into history, that's a wonderful place, too. But, yeah, Buffalo hunting days, guy. I just love that history. Oh, it looks like the chat's kind of slowing down here a little bit, which is all right. We've been going for about an hour, which just getting into it. But yeah, for those of you that jumped in a little bit late here, yeah, if you're uh, still looking for a holster, um, I've got them on the Etsy store that's down there in the description box below. If you want to take a look and see what we got currently in stock, I think there's one or two I've got listed over there. Um, if you want to custom order one, do so through DukeFraserProductions at gmail.com. If you get it within the next week, I can probably turn it out pretty quick. In fact, I'm going to try to make a point of having everything done by the 11th of April if I can. Um, and uh, after that, it's going to be hit and miss and when I can get things turned out and get them done. Um, Ryan says, what's the recoil like on a 405 grain 4570 with 70 grains of black powder? One thing I've learned with uh, when I reloaded black powder is that, you know, putting 70 grains of that much powder in a case and then getting the bullet on top of that. Um, yeah, the case is designed to hold 70 grains, but in reality, it, it winds up getting down to 55 to 60. Um, I think the military load was, and JH might be able to, uh, verify this if I remember right um it was a 405 grain bullet on top of 55 grains of black powder um or that was a carbine load maybe I can't remember but I do remember that it was not a full 70 grains because I think the designation was um 45 55 405 that military designated that because it was 45 caliber, 55 grains of powder over with a 405 grain bullet. And then it went to 45, 55, 500. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was 500 in the 1880s. They went to a heavier bullet. Well, Plowboy, um, I'd agree with you that on the plus P, that the exception of my pet or solely says black powder only on the barrel because mine is not a uh, not rated for those. They do make them rated for those hotter loads, but mine, you really got to pay attention to what's on the uh, um, on the barrel. Mine says black powder cartridge only, so I've got to shoot trap door loads out of mine uh, to keep it under the pressure. You got to stay. For those, you got to stay under the 18,000 PSI mark. Ryan Carter, yeah, 55 grains will compress. It don't compress a whole lot, but it will compress. I can't remember when I loaded, because I tried loading the 500 grain paper patch out of mine, and I couldn't get them to stabilize, and I think I was cramming 65 in there through a drop tube. And then with a the powder compression die, and I was compressing them down to get the bullets to seep far enough where they weren't hanging up on the rifling um it's been a long time since i've done that though so take what i say with a grain of salt because like i said it, it has been a, a while um squib loads in sounds like he's gonna kind of catch what he can on it and uh, I don't know if Squib Load's video has gone live yet, but he also did a review on our holsters as well. Um, so uh, check that out, too, for those of you that are contemplating buying. Because uh, I could sit up here and tell you all the great things I want about the holsters, but that don't mean nothing. Hearing it from the people that have bought, that's, that's where the money's at. I haven't had too many complaints. Um, there's probably a few people that might complain about my turnaround time because I kind of got 
like I said last year, it took me a long time to get some holsters returned, and that's nobody's fault but my own. <laughs> and the fizzy, yeah, those are fun loads. <laughs> Oh. So, Scott, yeah, that uh, um, Fort Union Park up there, yeah, that's a – I haven't been there. I've wanted to get there. I've got some, some fellow reenactors that work up there um, that I've talked with and chatted with. And sounds like it's a great place. One of these days I'll make it up there. But, yeah, it's uh, – trying to think of the name. Williston, North Dakota. It's over near there. It's on that interstate, goes through over by through Sydney, don't quote me on that. Uh, I think that's the interstate that goes through there. And Knife River Indian Villages is a nice one too. I haven't been there, but I had some friends that went up there for the Fur Trade Symposium a few years ago. Um, and uh, there's lots of good historic sites out there. So there's Knife, in Knife River Indian Villages. There's another one not too far from there. I think Teddy Roosevelt's, I don't remember right, that's not too far from Bismarck. Um, what's funny is I was not that far from Bismarck when I was up in South Dakota and I never made up there. But, of course, when I was in South Dakota, it was in the wintertime when you really didn't do much traveling. Yeah, and Fizzy, I bet that did shoot some fire out. It's amazing how flammable steel wool really is. Touch it to a two battery ends and you got a fire you almost can't put out. Oh. Scott Fort Lincoln. Yeah. Is that national or is that a state park? I can't remember. But that Fort Lincoln's in kind of the time period that I'm going to be doing up at Fort Laramie over in Wyoming there. Which I was wanting to travel up there and kind of just get an idea and get a feel of the place before I started working. Now uh, look at the way the price of gas is going. You can tell I haven't been doing a lot of traveling lately. So last time I bought gas, I paid two forty-five a gallon. Um, um, yeah, I paid two forty-five a gallon for gas. Dad and I went to go fishing the other day. And it was three seventeen a gallon. Hey, the nine twelve trains on time. Um, you know, since I started doing this chat, I've been noticing the trains a hell of a lot more. Um, so I paid three seventeen. No, I take that back. It was three seventeen in town. I waited till I got down to a couple towns over, and it was three oh seven there. So I I filled up there. Yeah, I was surprised. I'm like, holy crap! Did not take long for gas to go. Whoop. And I'm sure we can all, pretty much everybody in this chat will agree as to the reason why that is, and we won't get into it. But, uh, yeah, was not real pleased to learn the price of gas when I've got to be, when it's going to be one of those years where I've got to pay rent and pay for gas to get to work. Yeah, Nefuzi, I think we can all agree with you on that one. Uh, Jordan Bell, kind of don't like the high belt. I'm going to assume that means holsters for large frame Smith & Wessons. You ever make one for a uh, newer double action? Um, no, we, we and we talked about this uh, a few minutes ago, and I'll, I'll go ahead and, and, and reiterate it here. Um, I don't make them for the modern ones because I just don't get that many requests for the modern ones. Um, and... Bangs, I don't own that many modern revolvers except for a little snub nose uh, K frame style. Um, I just can't justify buying a mold to make them. One of these days when I making enough money doing this full time, or if I win the lottery, um, I will buy a crap ton of uh, aluminum molds and I'll start making more of the modern stuff. But Right now, just uh, 
not a lot of uh I just don't have enough demand to justify buying the, the molds to make modern holsters. Unless, like I said, I can get enough um, enough requests in for one to justify buying a, a uh, the mold that comes in. Scott Grumpy, yeah, okay, yeah. I thought Fort Lincoln was a the state a state park up there, but yeah. Yeah, the Missouri River is an impressive river. So I wasn't too far from it when I was in South Dakota, but a lot of the Missouri River, and I'm not sure if this is true for all of North Dakota, but a lot through South Dakota, it's mostly lakes. Uh, it's reservoirs. And uh, you got Oahe, which that starts in Pier and goes, I'm pretty, I think that's the one that goes clear up into North Dakota there a little ways. Um, and I never got over and did any fishing on it, and it's one of the best walleye fishing places in um and uh, the Dakotas, from what I'm told, but yeah, I always, always loved it when I got a chance to go across the Missouri River and see the Missouri River. It's just so impressive. And Lake Oahe is impressive. God, that's an impressive lake. And I, when I was in college, I had to do a class. It was two weeks. It was a field class, and we was on uh, Lake Fa Francis Case, which is down by Chamberlain, South Dakota. Beautiful country. Just absolutely beautiful country. One of the uh, days we went out, we was going in the boat up the river, and uh, Professor looked up and he said, "You see that? And there's this perfectly square uh, formation in the dirt. I mean, you could you could see it. You know, you had this one type of soil in the middle. It was just different, a perfect square." And he said, "You know, there was some settler or somebody uh, trapper." Somebody had died there, and that was their grave. Um, but he said the state had, had noticed it and documented it and had uh, taken what bones were, were washing out there. Um, and they said it was attributed to a uh, an Anglo. But, uh, yeah, lots of cool, cool history on the Missouri River. I mean, the Missouri River is what started the American West. Lewis and Clark went up the Missouri River. You had the historians that went up the Missouri River. Ashley's crew is the first set of trappers that come, or one of the first groups of trappers that comes up the Missouri. And it's just so much history there. Hugh Glass got mauled in that area. Um, in fact, he got mauled right up by the little town of Lemon, South Dakota. Um, and crawled back to Fort Kiowa, which is at Chamberlain. That's uh, under the Missouri River now. Um, it's under Lake Francis Case, but... Uh, yeah, just so much history on the Missouri River. Yeah, J.H., uh, <laughs> not to get too political, but you're absolutely right. Yeah, it's 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 getting ridiculous. Um, I can only hope things get better, but I don't think they will. I think you're just going to continue to get worse. I wouldn't be surprised to see five gallons, of, $5 a gallon by the end of the year, which is going to be terrible, absolutely terrible. Um... You know what's funny in the Fousey is uh, they do make those style of holsters for the ladies. <laughs> but with a 500, yeah, it's going to take a, a, a well-endowed woman to conceal that. be like carrying a walker up there. In fact, I don't doubt that the walker and the 500 have similar dimensions. Um, so, yeah, if you're looking for uh, a uh, 500, maybe a walker holster might accommodate. I don't know. I can't say. I don't have a 500 to test. <sighs> yeah, Scott, I, I've i got some modern guns, and it's not that I'm not interested in them. I just have them because for reasons. Um, but uh, I would love to have a 1911. Um, I was down looking because... I'd like to get another semi-auto handgun. Um, I love my little 38 Special, but I would love to get a, a semi-auto handgun. Um, and you have this 38 as a supplemental. Um, I'd love to have a 1911. If I get a 1911, it's going to be the traditional GI style. And that is one of the holsters I offer for a more modern uh, weapon. I do have a 1911 holster. In fact, I got one right here that i got to get a toe plug in. And this one, whenever I get it up for sale, is going to go for cheap because it was off of the edge piece, off a of double shoulder. And so it's 
got it's mostly about seven to eight ounce but there's one corner on it that's like six ounce so it's not that great but that's uh the only thing i offer for 1911 and you might stick a glock in that i don't know if you can find a glock at similar size to a 1911 you can probably fit it in there but uh yeah it's a it's a double loop so it's traditional to the um early 1900s and i've got tons of pictures i've looked up from 1911s and double loop holsters so that's the only reason i made that one but i need to get a 1911 blue gun because i made one just like that the developed pattern for it for a guy and he decided he didn't want a double loop and then uh i uh he wanted to, to do a different style I went to get in touch with him again after I got it done. I had never heard back from him, so I don't know if he changed his mind or something happened there. But uh, um, I need to get a blue gun to make sure that fits because the only one I had to base it off of was one of those little commander models. And my uncle wound up getting that double loop, and his commander fits nice. But I don't know if a full-size one's going to – I'm sure it'll fit fine. But I need to get a blue gun to test it for sure. Um. So, J.H., the Model Smith & Wesson, I don't have, I've got a, the the Taurus knockoff of the, uh, I've got a Taurus 856, which is basically the 586. Um, and I used to have a Smith & Wesson SD40, and I sold it because it was getting to where it was jamming terrible, and then I felt so stupid because what had happened was is that the mag release on it, because I have put thousands of rounds to that pistol. Um, the mag release had wore out because it's plastic. Stainless steel on plastic, it wears out. And what was happening was is that the mag release wasn't holding the mag as far up in the gun as it was supposed to. So it wasn't feeding properly. I, I tried everything. I polished the feed ramp and tried this, that, and the other. And that damn thing would just jam all the time. But what was funny is it would not feed all the way. So when I do the tap and rack routine to clear it, when I tap it, it would feed. I mean, just instantly go in and feed and close. I couldn't figure out what the hell it was. And then I went and sold it. And right after I sold it, I realized that, oh, crap. All I had to do was replace that mag release. I felt so stupid. Because I did love that Smith & Wesson 40 SD, but... I think if I was to do it over again, I wouldn't buy it because I sold all my damn mags except for one. I had 10 mags to go with it. Um, I think if I do it over again, I go with a Glock. Glock 23 is what's on my list. If I can find one for under 500, which that ain't going to happen anytime soon. Um, but yeah, I would love to have a Smith and Wesson, uh, the 44 mag model, um, 19, model 19. I shot one of them. They're fun. Yeah, Scott, I'd love to have an actual Colt, but my budget says auto ordinance or Rock Island. Either one. I've handled an auto ordinance and I love them. I, did. I don't know what it is. I've handled an Arnold ordinance. I've handled a Rock Island. Both of the GI model, the auto ordinance just felt better. Yeah, I don't know what it is. It just had a better feeling um, when you held it in your hand. And, of course, auto ordinance was making the 1911s in World War II, so that's probably why it felt like a genuine Colt 1911 because they just have a feeling to them. And the Rock Islands, they just felt bulky. I had a friend that had one of them, and he sanded the grips down, and it, it improved the feel on it, but... I don't know. I think I would go with auto ordinance if I had a chance. That, or I might take out a sec or take out a mortgage and uh, buy a Singer model 1911. I've handled. I've seen. Well, I haven't handled it. I didn't. I didn't want to touch it. But I seen one of those that was made by the Singer Sewing Machine Company during World War II, and Singer did such a good job of making 1911s that the U.S. government took them off of making 1911s and started having them make the bomb sites for the B-17s. Yeah, and if it was the uh, EEA Bounty Hunter, that would be a fun one. Like I said, I like shooting 44 mags. I just don't like buying ammo for them. 
The only, I had a, a buddy of mine, he bought a 44 mag Smith and Wesson and it had the rosewood grips and we shot that thing, but that thing, the grips weren't fitted real well to the gun and they had a tendency to kind of chew your hand up right in here. I don't know if he got it done yet or not, but he was going to put a rubberized grip on it, which would have made that so much more enjoyable to shoot. But I, uh, <laughs> JH, I just seen this one back there. Yeah, I like that. How do you like me now? <laughs> oh. Scott Grumpy. Yeah, up there in North Dakota, there's not a lot going on for Civil War. Um, you're getting more into the Indian Wars up in there. Um, but, uh, yeah, because when I'm going out in Fort Laramie during the Civil War, You've got um, you've got the start of the Indian War starting to come about. Um, not a lot of action going on out there, but you know, towards the end of the Civil War, you start seeing more when people more people are starting to move out west. Um, yeah, it's just uh, the Civil War out in the the west. There's there's not a lot to it, but there is some there. Down where I'm at, there's more going on at that time. So you have, uh, God dang it, I think it's Sibley. Okay, I can never remember these two. It's Camby and Sibley. You battle a Glorietta Pass. You have the Confederacy trying to come up into New Mexico to claim the gold fields in New Mexico and the gold fields in Colorado. You've got the Union pushing them back. They have a battle at Glorietta Pass where, you know, the Confederacy, it's basically the Gettysburg of the West. The Confederacy loses terribly and they're sent back into Texas. Um, and after that, you know, the uh, volunteers that are out here in Colorado are getting restless. You're starting to have Indians that are starting to raise problems. You've got uh, farmers that are, that are killed and it's attributed to the Cheyenne, whether it was a Cheyenne or not, we don't know. Um, and, uh, you know, that leads up to the uh, Battle of Sand Creek in 1864. So there's a lot going on, you know, in my part of the country during the Civil War, but, you know, not totally war related other than, you know, Glorietta Pass, which takes place down just across the border in New Mexico. The hell was that? Looks like something was flashing a light in my window. Well, maybe it's a local lunatic kind of prodding around. He's been known to do that at night. Uh, anyway, yeah, I think I've talked about that in another chat somewhere too, talked about that history. But yeah, you got Glorietta Pass. Then you've got the uh, Espinoza brothers incident uh, during the Civil War. And that's uh, just an interesting story in and of itself. You know, some guys that was in southern Colorado, northern New Mexico, kind of got fed up with the way that Anglos had been treating them. And they just, two brothers go on a killing spree. And, uh, you know, they kill quite a few people before they finally get caught and killed and get their heads cut off to be taken back as proof of them being found and killed. <clears throat> um, that was contracted out to a trapper, Tom Tobin. Um, he went out and got him after the army couldn't catch him. Local law couldn't catch him. And uh, yeah, he made sure that they didn't do that anymore. If they'd have been smart. They'd have hired him off from the get go. And then of course you got Sand Creek, which, you know, ties into where I used to work at. Uh, Cause the guy that, had built the establishment where I used to work at. He abandoned that in 49 after the end of the Mexican war. Cause in 49, there's big cholera epidemic and it comes all over the U S. Um, in fact, I was just, uh, reading up on, uh, some on Fort Laramie and Fort Laramie was kind of like the last point where the cholera advanced going West because most of the people died before they got to Fort Laramie that had it. And after Fort Laramie, there's not a lot of them. Uh, the, the cholera doesn't get that far out there. Um, that put that uh, the Bent's Fort out of business. And then Bent comes back a few years later, builds a new fort a little further down the river, starts trading with the Indians, winds up selling that to the Army. And, uh, you know, he goes to ranching not too far away, becomes an Indian agent. And, uh, you know, he has half-breed children that are living at Sand Creek. In fact, one of his children... Um, had fought for the Confederacy. He was an artilleryman. He got caught and 
got sent back home under parole. And, uh, you know, Bill Bent thought, okay, you know, most of Colorado is union sympathizing and, you know, you're not going to be safe around, you're already a half-breed. Now they think you're a half-breed trader. Probably better if you go be with the Indian, your Indian family out on the reservation where nobody's going to bother you. <laughs> not too long after that, well, then his other son gets told to lead the army there to Sand Creek under the guys of, you know, we're going to go bring them in for peace council. And then both sons are there when the shooting starts at Sand Creek and, you know, we have a national disaster on our hands. Okay. I haven't been paying attention to the chat here. Um, Jeremy said, yeah, I got to teach a class on Captain Ball Revolver because my local sheriff's people start to carry them. Yeah, I can see that. Scott says auto ordinance is a great way to go. That's what I've been thinking, but I think they're starting to get up there out of my price range last I looked. But, you know, when things kind of settle back down, maybe they'll get better. But uh, Yeah, J.H., down there in the south, I would 100% agree with what you said. <laughs> yep. Yeah, Scott, the fun calibers are expensive. I went down to the gun store, two gun stores, and they had one. They had 40 Smith & Wesson in stock. They had some oddball 32 h and mag, 32 Smith & Wesson in. They had some oddballs in stock, lots of them. Um, they had a little, very little 9 millimeter. In fact, they had so little a 9 millimeter, they was reserving that for the people who were buying 9 millimeter handguns. Um, so... None of the other gun store I went to, they had nine millimeter handguns out the wazoo, but they didn't have. And that's one thing I found interesting. The price of most guns has not really skyrocketed. And I think that's because the amount of ammo that's available, is not as many people are buying the guns, so it's keeping the gun prices down. But I was surprised to find uh, a Taurus semi-auto nine millimeter for about 250 bucks. The only reason I didn't buy it is they didn't have any ammo there. Um, which now, knowing I need to go to the eye doctor, I'm glad I did not buy that. <coughs> Excuse me. I apologize for those of you who grossed out by my snorting and snobbling, but my allergies are getting to me here. But uh, yeah, it's, this stuff's hard to find. What I should have done is I should have bought all the 300 wind mag that I could get my hands on last fall when I was deer hunting. and Because I could get 300 wind mag for you know 20 bucks a box, which is unheard of. I don't know if that store didn't know what they had or if they mislabeled it, but 20 bucks a box for 300 wind mag, <laughs> that is a pretty damn good price if you ask me. Yeah, Scott, sibling can be with the two that was going at each other down there. Uh, Scott, have you seen, watched any of the show where they were looking for clothes and guns from Custer's Troops? No, but I watched a documentary um, where they had this uh, rifle that the family claimed had been the Little Bighorn battle. But they didn't have any documentation really to prove it. Um, you know, it was in pretty damn good condition, but it didn't have any, you couldn't see any of the uh, marks on it uh, saying what company and stuff it was from. And... Uh, you know, they wanted to donate it to Little Bighorn uh, Battlefield. So Little Bighorn Battlefield says there's one way we can tell if this gun was here. And they went in, they loaded a blank, and they fired it. And they took that case out, and they compared the firing pin mark on it to what they had in the um, repository. And they found that that rifle was there, and they could tell you everywhere on the battlefield where that rifle was fired. And if I remember... Oh, Ryan, don't apologize, hell. I don't expect everybody to go through two hours of me rambling. So, yeah, if you got to go to bed, man, don't don't apologize for that. Man, go ahead. Um, you don't need to apologize. We're glad to have you here. And, you, know, you, you can always catch up later on it, uh, what you missed. Uh, anyway, uh, where was I? Yeah, so they found everywhere where this rifle had went and come to find out, you know, it was a rifle that the trooper had been killed 
then the Indians had picked it up and it started shooting it back at the troopers there, which I thought was an awesome story. And when I was working down here at Bent's, Sand Creek Massacre National Historic Site um, is part of a group that that, that park is in. Uh, Bings, the two are, are so linked together in history. Um, so somebody uh, donated a rifle back to the Sand Creek Park, and it was a rifle that had been at Sand Creek. And it looks like a Sharps, but it's not. It's called a Star, which is basically a Sharps, but it looks like one of those... Um, uh, what was advertised for a while as a Confederate because it had all brass fittings on it. Um, but yeah, it was a star star carbine. And they could prove that it had been at the battlefield, which I thought it was cool just to see something that had been there on that day. There was a couple people that were there that didn't like looking at it because they considered it a murder weapon. But, you know, it's history. It's something that connects you to the site. Yeah, Scott, I, I, I love giving history lessons. Uh, history is something I just love. I need to do more reading on it and kind of broaden my knowledge, but what knowledge I have, you know, I love to share. But I don't remember what documentary. It's an older documentary. Um, I think it was probably in the 2000s is when they filmed that. Um, then they had another documentary where they went in, where they showed where they was going through and they was finding the, the casings at different points on the battlefield. And then they was going in and, and they were analyzing them, you know, just like the FBI does when they're analyzing evidence, you know, find out which cases were where, and they could find out where the Indians were at firing, where the troops were at, because the troops are all pretty much using 4570s and 45 Colts. The Indians are using uh, what cartridge guns they have, are predominantly repeating lever actions. Your Henry's 66 Yellow Boys, um, mostly the Henry rifles, and so they could tell who was where and when. And you know they could t pretty much tell when a trooper's rifle was taken from his body and then used against the other troopers because all of a sudden you start seeing 45, 70 shells in places where you've got the Henry rounds at it just, it was so cool to, to watch that. And it, it told so much of the story of what went on there. Uh, Jeremy, no, I haven't. I canceled my Netflix. I got tired of paying the high dollar for the one, but I think I had the mid mid range package. Um, and, uh, you know, I was charging like $17 a month. And I was like, between that and I had an HBO subscription so I could watch Deadwood. And I had a Star subscription so I could watch Hell on Wheels because it went off Netflix. And a couple of others I was really like, holy crap, you know, I'm losing quite a bit of money for just watching TV shows. So I went and canceled them all, but I wanted to keep the Netflix. And, uh, so I uh, went to the basic plan. I switched, and when I did that, they freaking just started. Whenever I get on Netflix, you know, it was so grainy you couldn't even tell what you was watching. It was like listening to a radio show because you couldn't even look at the picture. And when they did that to me, I said, "To hell with it. That's the way they're going to do it." When you change to a basic plan, I canceled it. Anytime I get a hankering to watch something on Netflix, I just borrow my sister's login info and I log in and watch it. I, I don't give them money more anymore. Because uh, I kind of got fed up with it. And really, they didn't have really... It was Netflix is getting to where they didn't have much of anything I wanted to watch anyway. Yeah, Plowboy, uh, the reason... Uh, it wasn't Stars I subscribed to, damn it. It wasn't Stars. It was uh, AMC. If you got Amazon Prime, you can subscribe to AMC for like an extra eight bucks a month, and Helen Wheels is there. I think that's why they took Helen Wheels off Netflix, is because AMC went to broadcasting their own stuff. Um, I think Turn is still on Netflix, um, which I didn't not enjoy Turn, but it wasn't the greatest show I watched. I, I watched it just because I thought some of it was good, but for the most part, I didn't really. It wasn't the top of my list. 
And then I tried watching Frontier. I think I was Frontier with Jason Momoa. And I couldn't get into that one. Uh, Cause that was Hudson, but and they talked fur trade in Hudson's Bay, and I watched that, and I was like, "There's so many things that's wrong here." Being a history buff, uh, I couldn't get into it. Yeah, Star Trek. I, I thing on Star Trek um, was that uh, you know I, I loved watching that as a kid, but then I got to watching it, and Star Trek had hour long episodes. And 24 episodes a season times like 12 seasons for next generation. I was like, holy crap. You know, I can't binge watch that and get through a season in, you know, a day or two. So I, uh, um, I quit watching it because <laughs> it got, there was so much going on. But what movie was I watching the other night? There was a, Oh, Stargate. I watched Stargate the other night. I forgot. I had watched that as a kid, and I kind of enjoyed it. And I watched it again last night, I think it was. That was pretty good. It had been a while since I watched it. I kind of like some of that sci-fi. Not a lot of it, but I like some of it. Uh, Scott, the Crow and Cheyenne have admitted they took all the belongings from the troopers and stashed the stuff into one of the caves in Sandstone Bluff by the Reno River. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, wouldn't be surprised one bit. Because, you know... After they wiped out Custer, there wasn't really anybody there around that would cause them any problems from, from taking what they wanted. And I'll tell you what, if I was in the position they were, and I had all these weapons and ammo uh, laying around and all these other um, useful items, there is no doubt in my mind I'd be grabbing guns and gun belts and grabbing what I could to keep on going as long as I could. But I would love to work at Bighorn. But the thing is, when I, work, when I look at a history site and if I just try to decide if I want to work there, one of the things I look at is do they do living history? Because that's what I like to do is living history. And uh, I don't think they do that at Little Bighorn. Yeah, Scott, I love binge watching Hell on Wheels. <laughs> And uh, I had the, got the Bohannon holster that I sell, which when Hell on Wheels was on Netflix, that's what everybody wanted was a Bohannon holster. Since I took that off, the interest just kind of dropped down. I think Squib Load, um, he ordered a couple from me. Um, but, you know, the request for that have, has drastically declined. Um, but, yeah, I... I Hell on Wheels had so much that was historically wrong with it, but AMC did a damn good job of making it entertaining enough that I was willing to overlook some of that. Um, I've been thinking about trying to make um, Elam's holster. I need to, to look into that and, and uh, try to make his holster too. I think that would be a fun project. And speaking of Bohan holster, so I showed one holster here on a chat before, and then I wound up tossing it over the side there because I said it was a, a screwed up uh, a prototype. And I got thinking, I was wanting a holster for a seven and a half inch barrel that had that rounded skirt. <laughs> and I was selling them um, Bohan holsters um, that, they, that had been ordered. And I got to look at them, I was like, why in the hell did I try to start off a new pattern for that that I screwed up? All I had to do is take that Bohannon holster, extend the body out, put a toe plug in it, and it was exactly what I wanted to begin with. One of those duh moments. <laughs> so when I get some leather and I'm going to try that, I'm going to offer a, a, a newer, new model for the uh, seven and a half inch. Yeah, Plowboy, I got to have the Griswold handy. Yeah, Plowboy, it was, uh, yeah, they tried to, what I found funny was, they called Bohannon's a Griswold. 
1860 army um with uh um the 1860 army of the brass farine within the next i think it was the next season um then they had actual griswolds but they never talked about them being griswold and they still had bohan's griswold you know the old brass ring 1860. yeah that was uh and I've talked about this before, but I watched the behind the scenes where they was talking with the armor. I don't know how the hell he got that job. When he starts talking about 1880s blunderbuss that was used by the British Navy and calling it a flintlock when it was very obvious it was a cap lock. And it was not an 1880s brown bass. It was a CVA brown bass. Or not brown bass, excuse me, uh, blunderbuss. It was a CVA blunderbuss. I'm like, no. Just no. And the 1866s were overrepresented, I thought. Probably would have been better with uh, some more Henrys in there and some Spencer carbines in there. Um, yeah, the armor should not have been the armor on that. The brass, yeah, and the brass frame was well over, over represented. Scott's, no, they, they, they had, it was very clearly 1860, but they did wind up, like I said, they did wind up with some actual Griswolds later on. And then they had a walker in there and, uh, I don't think I remember the armor talking about a walker and his history was off on that. And uh but I never seen the walker in the uh the series show up. Uh right, I'm gonna get rid of that one here for a second. Um but yeah, it was uh Yeah, it needed some improvement. I'll just say that. <laughs> I've been thinking about uh, I was thinking about doing like a movie review on here on some of the old historical uh, or not historical, some of the Western movies. Uh, the only thing is, I don't know how that goes with the copyright laws, but uh, and I think I've talked about this on the thing too. But I was watching kind of this horror movie that was based in the Civil War. It's called Dead Birds. Um. And I can't remember any of the actors or names that were in it, but uh, um, I was watching that, and they didn't do terrible on the guns. I think I've seen one brass frame pistol in the whole thing, and you know, other than that, everything looked pretty daggum good. Um, yeah, I uh, <laughs> thought about doing a review on that, and but like I said, I don't know how the copyright laws work with that song kind of leaning away from doing it but thought about trying to do a review on hell on wheels and the one that i'd mentioned um uh that dead birds i was gonna do one i can't remember what the other one was but yeah jeremy that would have been he swept, swapped to the Remington in the second season, so that might have been the time that they swapped the uh, the armor. Because that was about the time you start seeing freaking 1866s all over the damn place. Um, they had a Sharps. They had a Sharps in there, which I thought was cool. Um, things they didn't call the Sharps. They said, bring up the long rifle. Then they had... A Pieta 1851 Navy that they showed in one scene, and you can see Pieta on the barrel. So, yeah. I think just about anybody that is in the chat here would have been a better armorer than the guy that they had hired. Which, Hollywood wants to hire me for an armor, I'd be glad to accommodate them. Except I probably have to add quite a bit more into my inventory to pull that off, but I'd be willing to do that. 
Yeah, it looks like the chat's kind of slowing down here. Yeah, Scott, you got that right. They count on nobody knowing what it is because they don't half of them don't know what it is. And one thing that aggravated me in that show, so there's one scene where they was talking about in the behind the scenes with the armor about Lily Bell having, you know, kind of a a small derringer for self protection. They got this little double barrel, which was an Ethan Allen, uh, a Hoppy's Ethan Allen copy when Hoppy's was making them. And Hoppy's made some damn good ones. Out of it. I don't want to say anything bad about them, and they were historically accurate. But uh, they uh, talked about her, you know, being a woman, you know, having a smaller gun. And I was sitting there thinking, okay, you're giving her the double barrel. That's fine. Um, what's his name? Durant had a uh, one of those Hoppies, Ethan Allen pepper boxes, which is great. You know, they're around. Why doesn't anybody have a Colt 49 pocket model? The single most produced cap and ball revolver of the Colt line, the 49 pocket model, was made from 48 to 1872 with something like 300,000 of them made. And you don't see a one. Not one ever showed its face anywhere in Hell on Wheels. Okay. Yeah, pepper boxes were around, but you'd think somebody like Durant, who's got money, if he's going to buy something for protection, might go with a little higher dollar end gun and go with the Colt 49 pocket. You don't see any of the other pocket models. Um, in fact, I think all you see, the only guns you really see in that is the the only 1860 Army is Collins that they're passing off as a Griswold. You have that brass frame Remington that Johnson carries in the first season. Then they go to the Remington that, that Bohannon has, which is great. You see one or two 51 navies with a steel frame. Everything else is just brass frame junk. I mean, way overpopulated with brass frames. And then, of course, you know, 66 Yellow Boys, those were really overpopulated. Blah, boy, I was headed to being a stist. Yeah. <laughs> no kidding. And I'll give them credit. Some of the uh, the costumes that they had weren't terrible. But, you know, they're not the greatest. Yeah, Jeremy, yeah, you can't find any like now. Yeah, I think the only thing Midway's got in stock that I looked at was uh, they've got some some pocket models in. They've got the 49, the Wells Fargo, the 62 Navy and 62 Police. I think they got the first and second model Dragoon and the Walker in. Um, but, you know, their prices are a little bit high on the high end. Uh, yeah, it's bad. But yeah, it's like there's not enough. Oh, and then they had one. They uh, so uh, Elam carries a conversion. I thought that was nice. He had an 1860 conversion uh, that he carried. But uh, yeah, it just the armor. Just yeah, he should not have been on that project. Yeah, Nafuzi, they did have some third model, but I just checked. Um, Oh, about an hour before we started the live stream. And they had first and second model Dragoons listed. And that was the only Dragoons they had. Oh, let me look here. Let me see what they got in stock. It's, like I said, I just looked. Oh, excuse me. Good Lord. I thought that wasn't going to be as big as that was. I don't know what they've got in for... Uh, Pieta looks like they got 1860. Um, let's check available. Let's just go to Uberti. They only got 11 Uberti models in. So I've got the stainless Remington, which is really spendy. Got a Walker. They got a 49 Wells Fargo. They've got a second model 
uh, 62 pocket, the five and a half and six and a half inch, the pocket Navy. First model Dragoon, 62 pocket and five and a half, the 49 pocket. I don't know why they're showing that as the in stock when it says out of stock, no back order. Um, then they've got the brass framed uh, 1860, which I've been thinking about buying one of them. Um, I'd like to get one with a fluted cylinder, but God, they charge a hell of a lot more for that fluted cylinder than it's really worth. Yeah, I got a lot of things that are uh, popping up here on the side chat. All hell, Dustin just posted a thing on the... So if y'all are part of the Captain Ball Revolvers, Pistols, and Rifles on the um, on the Facebook, Dustin just posted that you know he's starting to see some black powder show up where he's at over in Utah. Looks like they've got a... Uh, they got a Dragoon. Can't tell what model it is because they got a gun lock on it. I can't see the back strap. Or excuse me, the trigger guard. Um... They got a 1860, looks like a Pieta. They got a brass frame 51 Navy. They got a Remington, a brass frame Remington, and looks like a Pieta 51 Navy. But yeah, it's uh, things are starting to show up, but you know they're not. It's not going to be as what it was. It looks like that may be a third model Dragoon they've got there. But, uh, yeah, there's some stuff showing up. There's just not a lot. Yeah, Nafuzi, yeah. Fortunately, priorities. I wished I would have got in. There was a, oh, a bunch of walkers that come in. Oh, it's been a couple of years ago. Um, they came in. They sell them for like 250 bucks. I should have grabbed one then. I tried to sell some Walker holsters when they came in, but nobody wanted to buy one. Um, but yeah, there was, I don't know how many, but $250 a piece. I was like, uh, do I really need a third Walker? No. I'm going to buy other stuff. And right now, I think Midway had the Walker. I've got listed as $419, which is not terrible, but they've got the, the regular price, price listed as $489 because those things have gone up to about $500 now. It's just getting terrible. Uh, it really is. Oh, crap. What the hell did I just do? Got so many freaking buttons on the computer. It's not even funny. Well, Jeremy's signing off. Yeah, Scott, I could probably help him with the scripts, too. That's right. Yeah, I was just watching Deadwood and Deadwood just, I won't say it was perfect, but Deadwood, they did a lot more in that Western um, for historical, for not for the story so much historical accuracy, but for the, the costumes and such. Um, God, Deadwood was awesome. I uh, wish they hadn't canceled that. This guy says, I've not seen one in a movie other than Josie Wales. Oh, uh, you talking about The Walker? Um, that Mel Gibson movie that just came out with uh, Santa Claus, he uses a walker in that. Um, God, the hell. Uh, there was another movie that had a walker in it that I watched. I can't remember what it was. It was a newer Western that I didn't really care for. Uh, you see a few of them around, but in 49 pocket models, yeah, Josie Wales, I think it's the last one I've ever seen a 49 pocket model in. Um, it's funny is that uh, the all of Josie Wales, <clears throat> there was a little bit extra brass frames in that than what should have been, but that really is the last movie that was made where, you know, they really paid attention to the historical accuracy of the firearms at the time because, you know, they're they're shooting cap and ball revolvers. Um, you don't see lever-action rifles at all. 
everybody's got you know single shot black powders josie whale's got the sharps that he shoots um but everybody's got you know they do represent you know the conversion cylinders i think a little bit early on the colts they've got them colt uh, uh the richards mason conversions in there a few of them i think they were represented a little bit too early for that time um but still, I mean, Josie Wales made in what, 1973, 72? It was early 70s because Vietnam was still going on, I'm pretty sure. Um, you uh, you don't really see much attention to that detail. Um, I guess Pale Rider, they have some use of capping balls in there, but the thing with Pale Rider is they got Clint Eastwood with his belt full of cylinders. No. No, that's that that's Hollywood. The fizzy. <laughs> yeah, you got that right. I get so sick and tired of them. My sister's into them Hallmark movies. And I get so fed up with that. Bullshit. Sorry, it's getting late. I'm getting tired. I'm starting to curse now. Winger on the chat here for a little bit longer. Um, squib load. Would a 49 pocket be carried in a holster, or is it literally meant to be carried in the pocket? Both. Um, you know, early on, probably carried in a pocket. Uh, but by the time you start getting in 1850s and going into the gold fields, you start seeing holsters pop up for that pretty soon. It's amazing how fast holsters evolve with the development of, like, the Colt revolvers. Um you know, I've heard guys say that, uh, you know, historians say that, you know, wet molded holsters didn't exist back then. And, you know, I've got multiple pictures to say bullshit. Um, back packing iron, they've got a, a dragoon stuck in a wet molded holster. And I mean, it is tight. It looks like something had just been made in yesterday. Uh, very modern looking. Um, but you start seeing, you know, holsters like this for the pocket models. This is more of a Marshall you'd see later in the 1850s. Um, but holsters got pretty elaborate uh, really, really fast. When you look at holsters in the 1830s and 40s, they're all pretty plain. You know, they're just basically a sleeve, you know, like California Slim Jim style, just a sleeve that holds a single shot pistol. Um, when you start getting into the Patterson's, um, what comes out of Texas, you start seeing a little bit more elaboration. Um, I've seen a picture somewhere of a Patterson holster that's made out of Jaguar skin um, that come out of Texas. But a lot of your Patterson holsters are just very much simply a sleeve to hold the gun in. Um, and then, you know, after the Mexican War, you start finding gold fields, you start seeing more Colts show up. And then all of a sudden, it's just like holsters start to blossom. And I've had, you know, historian, living history guys tell me, you know, when you're doing holsters, buying a holster for use, you don't want anything real fancy. But if you find some high resolution pictures of uh, all those enhanced pictures of uh, holsters and, and photographs, they're all start showing tooling relatively quickly. Um, so, yeah, there's some. Uh, half flap holsters or full flap holsters like I just showed. Oh, uh, let's see here. I got the holster book out. I'm going to wear this book out so fast it's not even funny. I'm going to have to buy another one to put on the shelf. My pages are starting to come loose because I flipped through this thing so much. All right. Where is it? There it is. All right. So I'm going to read this off first so I don't try to, try to read it while I'm holding it up there. Uh, let's see, see, California pattern holsters with uh, paramilitary waist belt. So, yeah, your military waist belt styles, it's got those military buckles. You start seeing them in the civilian market as well in that time period. Um, this one's actually attributed to 1860, so um, this is getting later on out of the 1850s. But uh, it's uh, made in Winchester, which pretty famous company. Um, and they're, everything I've seen made by Maine and Winchester Shows quite a bit of tooling on it. Uh, San Francisco, California, 1860 to 65. Um, talks about the Barbary Coast. 
uh, fabricated of black dyed skirting leather. The diminutive holsters incorporate triple reef cro then I uh, triple recurve recurved throat profile. So that means it's got the cutout for the trigger guard and a cut to uh, accommodate the hammer as well. Um, sewn belt loops and close contoured main seams. Uh, pouches are tooled and foliate and floral motif are finished with end caps of engraved silver. Uh, and then they've got talk about the original um, 49 pockets that are in there only they've got the three inch barrels and this is one thing I wish you birdie would do is offer more barrel lengths on some of these pocket models that they've got especially the 49s but that's the ones they're talking about right there and I tell you what if I was to make something with that with that silver tips on there that would be a fairly spendy holster um, but that holster style is kind of what influenced uh, this style it's a little bit different and my holsters are not 100 percent copies uh, because i'm not looking directly at the originals in front of me so they're based off of what i can see in the picture of the photograph and so i try to base as close as i can you know i'm not a great artist so copying it 100 percent is not a strong point of mine but i try to get as daggum close as i can get um, see, I think there's another 49 pocket model in here. That's for 1860, 51 navies, Remington, Schofield. Let's get more into the cartridge area. There are some more black powders. And then you get into the loop holsters. And I'm pretty sure they don't have anything for a pocket model in the loop holsters. No, they don't. Um... Yeah, you'd be surprised how much in basket weave stamping. They've got basket weave stamping here in the 1885. Um, tooling, you know, starts popping up 1860s, but uh, you uh, most of what you see is a lot of carving or border stamping. You don't see like the modern tooling that looks freaking awesome. Wish I could tool as good as some of those guys. Um, let me see. Yeah, a lot of these are, are carved. I thought there was some more 49 pocket models in here other than that one because that's the real, real, real fancy ones. I thought they had a planer one in here besides the full flap. I thought I seen they had a picture of one, historic picture. Uh, there's a real beautiful one with a... Uh, is that a Merwin Holbert? No, that's not a Merwin Holbert. That is a Forehand and Wadsworth, which is a cool looking gun. The other one's the one. That's the one for the Merwin Holbert. It's next to it. Uh, I was sure that they showed another one for a pocket model. I guess I was wrong. Well, you got one for the flip up smith and wesson what the heck model is that it's the number two army revolver got a full flap for that one which is cool um scott says i've watched deadwood twice ah, I've, I've binge watched it more times than i can count i can almost quote that show But I won't quote it on here because, you know, I don't want to offend anybody with the, uh, how do I want to put it, eloquent Victorian speaking language they use. In fact, I just started it again here tonight just before I think I got, I think I got into episode three. I was just starting episode three, the first season. Because they just killed uh, Persimmon Phil. Swear engine had just killed Persimmon Phil. Yeah, I guess they didn't have that. I was just th I'm probably thinking of the photograph that's on my big desktop in the back. All right.
Let's see. <laughs> Plowboy, I don't know if they, they have an unhealthy amount of Deadwood. Maybe when you start talking and acting like Al Swearingen to the point, you know, at one point in time I was referred to as Al because I talked like Al quite a bit and quoted Al every chance I could, and I still do every once in a while. Oh. But yeah, if any of you got any questions for me, unfortunately I don't have a lot to show off tonight because like I said, most of the stuff I've got is what I showed in the last chat. But uh, if you want to order any holsters um, in the next couple weeks is the time to do it. Squib signing out, calling tonight. Yeah, I'm probably going to call it tonight here too before too long. It was 10 10. Tell you what, we'll run another 20 minutes. We'll go till uh, 10 30 and then we're going to shut it down. Because I got a pack of holster up, take it to the post office in the morning. <laughs> I've only seen Zombieland once, and I don't know. Zombie movies just don't really enthuse me all that much. I tried watching The Walking Dead. I couldn't really get into that. I think I got into the second or third season. I got to where they killed Herschel. And I think that was the last episode I watched. Is right, or no, take that back. I got there where they killed that blonde woman. Um... No, because a blonde woman they killed before they killed Herschel. So I got to the point where the prison, they wound up getting drove out of the prison. And then they was on the train and they was trying to catch up. And the Asian guy was trying to catch up with Maggie. What was his name? I can't remember. Um, wasn't Daryl. Or was it Daryl? I can't remember. I can't remember that because it's been so long since I watched it. JH is signing out. I'll see you later, JH. Um, yeah, Plowboy. I, I watched it when I was in college a little bit because my roommates watched it, but I just I gave it a shot. I tried. I couldn't get into it. And uh, where I worked down there, one of the ladies that worked in the bookstore. Oh my God, that's all she did was watch that. And she bought the comic books and read the comic books. And, you know, we're talking a lady that, uh, about the age of my dad, um, she was really, really into that stuff. So I told her, I was like, yeah, I said, I binge watched it. I got to this point and gave up on it. And she's like, oh, you got to watch it more. It gets better. And it's like, I just can't get into it. I'm sorry. Nafuzi, you're absolutely right on that. I'm being screwed over with the zombies hit right now. But the thing of it is, is if you rely 100% on ammunition, because the zombie apocalypse happens, you know, reloading and stuff is not going to be as feasible. It's going to be a situation like what we're in right now. This needs no reloading. So that's why, you know, I practice with the blades as well. I need to practice more because I'm not very good with it, but in a zombie apocalypse, zombies don't swing swords back, so I probably do okay. But yeah, I have to be well versed. I've heard people call me a gun nut, and one thing that I will correct them on is I'm not a gun nut. I am a student of weapons craft. I had a guy tell me he was an NRA instructor. He said, you need to pick one gun, learn how to use it. And I said, you're absolutely right to a point. But what happens when that gun's not working anymore and you're in a situation where you're grabbing another one, you can't just go to the store and get another one just like that. Um, 
you know, I would rather be versed and know how to shoot everything than just be good with one gun. I would rather be, I want to say, I would rather be good with all guns and not be perfect with one, if you get my drift. So that's why, you know, I don't own an AK, but I've practiced with AKs. Um, I've practiced with ARs. I try, I shoot different types of guns when I get the chance, you know, that's why when me and my buddies go out, you know, I'll try to shoot their guns and be proficient with them all. And sure, you know, there's benefit to being good with just one gun, knowing how it works, but at the same time, I think there's better benefit knowing uh, um, all, all weapons. So like I said, I'm more of a student of weapons craft. Fuzzy. Yeah, I wouldn't want to be in arm's length. I'm not confident in my blade skills. I'm not confident either, but, you know, if I was taking on Doug Markaida, I'd be dead in half a second. If I was taking on a zombie, I think I'd have a better chance. Slightly better chance. Because all a zombie wants to do is eat. I want to live. There you go, Nafuzi. Yeah, master's degree in trigonometry. Yeah, Scott, I love binge watching shows too. But the thing of this, sometimes I get to binge watching shows and then it interferes with me getting other stuff done. Like last year, I got to, I wasted two good days that I could have been doing garden work because I got to binge watching something. I think it was, uh, oh God, it was that one on Netflix about the Vikings. Uh,. It wasn't Norsemen because that one you can binge watch in a couple hours. Um, damn it. Uh, the Last Kingdom. I got to binge watch in The Last Kingdom. I haven't seen the newest season on it yet, but uh, kind of after the first season when I killed off that real hot girl, I was like, God damn it, I really don't want to watch that anymore. Then I watched the next season. It was all right. Then they killed off another hot woman. And I'm like, what the hell are you doing? You know, you get these characters that people start to really like and, and love, and you go and kill them off. What the hell? It's like Game of Thrones. I got so fed up with Game of Thrones so quick, I quit watching that. Jesus, that show pissed me off. Just get to where you're enjoying a character. <laughs> oh, there he's dead. And really, how many times does Sean Bean get killed in Hollywood? It's like, holy crap. It's like, hey, you know, we got this great character in this movie. We're trying to find an actor for it, but we're going to kill him off real fast. Oh, let's get Sean Bean. It's like, come on. Which reminds me, I need to find Sharp's Rifles and watch that because everybody tells me I need to watch that show. I've seen parts of it. It looks like it's pretty good. Yeah, and if it's 10 22s are pretty good. What's funny is this. When I shoot with my guns, I always get, you know, showed up and I look like shit. I can't shoot where the crap with them. But then I pick somebody else's gun up with it and I can't miss. But, uh, yeah, it's funny. A buddy of mine bought a Tokarov when we was in college. 762 Tokarov. You could not find the ammunition anywhere. And this is when we was in Rapid City. First stop gun didn't have it. Nobody had ammunition for a Tokarov. Everybody was selling Tokarov, but nobody had ammunition. It was like when the Nagant revolvers were cheap. Everybody had Nagant revolvers, but nobody had ammunition for them. And, uh, well, he finally found a source of ammo. He bought like 2,000 rounds or something. I don't remember. He bought a lot of ammo. Well, anyway, we always went to the range together, so we went out there, and he was shooting that thing, and he could not hit a water jug at 20 paces. He'd shoot all the way around that. I'm like, God dang. I'm like, really, dude? You know, he'd pop off five rounds at a water jug, and he might get two on him. And I finally asked him, I said, I'd like to try to shoot that. You know, just because it's toker off. It's a you know, World War II-made gun. And at that time, I was really into the World War II guns. 
as well as a black powder cap of balls. So I asked him, I said, hey, I said, you know, care if I shoot five rounds? He said, yeah, I don't care if you shoot five rounds. That's fine. And uh, I went over and uh, put the five rounds in, and he had five water jugs up there that he'd been shooting at all day and hadn't hit one of them yet. Stood right there where he was at. I pulled that thing up, and I went, one, two, three, four, five. Hit every one of them dead center. He got, that was the last time he let me shoot one of his guns. I mean, he was mad. I'm like, holy crap, I'm going to have to get one of them. But like you said, you couldn't find the ammo. So I started looking for one in nine millimeter and I did finally find one. But, you know, I was in South Dakota. I was a Colorado resident. I couldn't buy the handgun up there. And I'd had to ship it home and I wasn't going home for a whole, quite a while. So I couldn't justify doing it. Um, I can't remember what Toker on model. It wasn't the CZ. It was the, uh, it was made in Russia. It was a Russian made one. Uh, it was World War II vintage. Um, I would have loved to got my hands on that. I can't remember which one. I think it was a Romanian. It was in nine millimeter. Uh, had a little bit different grip handle. Um, because the one thing I had against that grip handle is it, it was so straight. And, you know, I'm used to shooting revolvers, so when I grip it, you know, natural, I couldn't even see the front sight because it was pointing so low. But, uh, yeah, that 7.62 for no more recoil than that round had, that bullet's got a lot of wallop to it. And I'm surprised it, it has phased out. You know, that would be an excellent, excellent round today, in my opinion. But, uh, yeah. And then he got a 1911. I remember that he got one of those Rock Island 1911s. That's one of the ones you got to take down with the paperclip. Took it out to shoot it the first time. <laughs> I'll never forget this day. It was 25 below. Colder and shit. We was out there shooting our Mosins, and he brought this 1911 along. And he puts a magazine in it. I mean, our noses are freaking red. You know, we're, we're borderline frostbite. And... You know, everything, when it gets that cold, it's like they say in that movie, Unforgiven, everything hurts more when it's cold. He pulls that 1911 up, he pulls that trigger, and he screams. And I'm like, what the hell happened? He's like, that brass case just whacked me on the nose. I mean, he's holding his nose there, and he's got this gun held out trying to, you know, compose himself and, and maintain, you know, you know, muzzle discipline. And, uh... He's like, I don't know if I want to shoot this again. He takes his hand down, and I look at it because I, well, I didn't know if he if it hit on the open mouth of the case and maybe cut his nose. I was like, well, let me take a look and see. <laughs> I looked and stamped backwards on his nose is 45 auto. <laughs> that brown come back and hit him so hard that you know it was able to leave the mark on his nose. We laughed so hard, and then he didn't want to shoot it, so I took it and I said, I'll shoot it once, and I put my hand up like this and. I fired a couple rounds after that. It was ejected fine. But that first round that came out of that gun, <laughs> it just rolled that round back and hit him in the nose. Oh, that was funny. Yeah, and if you have heard, some of them are really good and some of them aren't really crap. Um... Norinco was making a few of them for a while, but they weren't, they couldn't, for whatever reason, couldn't be imported into the U.S. I don't remember what the story was on that, but I remember they weren't imported. But everybody said that was the good ones to have. Yeah, I don't know what it is about a 1911, but I don't know if it's get, if it, it might be more the ammo, too. It could be the ammo that, that does it. He was shooting the cheap Winchester white box, but uh, yeah, I remember that. I remember that day clear. And then I remember one day, we, him and I went out to the shooting range, and I was doing a video on, uh, uh, well, I was, I was shooting for a video. I never wound up never doing that video, but uh, I... Uh, was doing that for that uh i just got that uh, 51 conversion that army san marco conversion that i've got that i love but i have a love-hate relationship with it um anyway shooting that and 
I had just shot my five round and I'm sitting there and I'm unloading it because I always unloaded it while I was standing up there on the firing line. He saw I wasn't shooting. He said, can I shoot? Go ahead. Yeah. He's got this new Marlin 22. I can't remember what model it is. The semi-auto Marlin. He's standing there and he just starts going, cranking out rounds as fast as he can. And them damn rounds were coming over and dropping between my hat and my coat collar. And they were going down my back. And them will were hot. And I mean, they're freaking falling down the back of my coat. And I'm like, hey, 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 hey. And I'm sitting there dancing. He's like, what the happened? What happened? I'm like, your shells are going down the back of my coat neck. <laughs> well, we had a good laugh on that one, too. Yeah, I was dancing out there like I had ants in my pants. But one of them damn things went all the way down my shirt, went in my butt crack. That was not comfortable. I had that happen one time, too, when I was, uh, I went to a, cowboy action shoot with a buddy of mine um because i wanted to kind of see what it was about and he shot and he borrowed money off me to shoot or to buy ammo and i told him i said well um we'll see you later scott um i uh told him i said you know i'll loan you the money for the ammo i said but uh you know you're gonna have to let me shoot that henry that you're using he says yeah we can do that so he saves 10 rounds for the Henry for me and uh, had my hat on. And I remember, I think it was the third or fourth round. I ejected up and that thing went up in my hat and I kind of just flipped my head back because I knew it was sitting up there. When I flipped it back, it went down the back of my shirt and went down my butt crack. And God dang, that was a hot round. But yeah, we shooting that Henry. I think it was at fifty yards on the steel gong, and I was shooting pretty good with it. But um, I tell you right now, I think I would take the Winchester over the Henry if I had to borrow one, because one, it's a little bit cheaper, and two, easier to load. And the don't, don't burn your hands on that thing too. After he shot that thing that day, oh god, that barrel was so hot when I shot it. All right, yeah, looks like the chat's slowing down. It's pretty much down to, I think Nafuz is the only one there commenting. Um, I think I missed a couple comments up here somewhere. Yeah, Scott, well, I think he's already signed off. But yeah, he says, imagine trying to reload a black powder pistol while somebody is after you. Yeah, that would be the that's why you get a walker, because then you got a club, and you club them over the head. Now, oh, Casey Scott's still there. All right, yeah. I know there's still some people there, because it says there's eight watching. It's a little slower tonight. Seems like when I start doing the chats weekly, you know, each one has a little bit less viewership on it. That's why I tried to do them like once a month when I was doing them before. And then I tried doing them once a week. And I just noticed that, yeah, when you do them every week, the viewership kind of declines on it. But uh, glad to have everybody that's here. You know, just kind of tie, relax, kind of chat a little bit, have a little fun conversation. Try to ignore the trolls that come through the chat. Um, yeah, it's just, I'm kind of glad the chat hasn't been too terrible here lately, but God, I remember that one night we had that chat, like, holy crap, trolls just wouldn't quit. Oh. But yeah so just to reiterate for those of you that are watching if you want to order a custom holster um within the next two weeks would be the time to do it i'm going to try to have everything done by the 11th of april like i said so i can focus on turkey hunting but uh i might have some time in between there because dad doesn't like to stay out um turkey hunting all day long we usually just do the morning um just hunt in the morning Casey Scott, do you ever do any paper cartridges for the walkers? No. 
I tried fooling around with paper cartridges there. Um, I tried to make my own mold to make them. That didn't work with the crap because, you know, it's funny as I can do, you know, detail work and stuff on holsters and, and run a knife and cut edges, and, you know, make them real look nice. These freaking fingers, when I start trying to roll them paper things around, I can't do it. I cannot roll a paper cartridge with a crap. Um, so I played with them a bit and just not something that I really enjoyed making. And I, I bought the, oh, they were a copy of the Cliff Manley cartridge formers. Um, I think I got them because Mark Hubs was marketing them for the guy for a while. Um, no, I take that back. I didn't get them from Mark Hubs. I got them from the guy that was making them out of New, he was out of New Mexico. Um, I got them. I tried them. I wasn't getting very good results out of them. Um, that and then in order to really use them, you got to modify. I don't think there's any of these U birdies with the exception of maybe the 61 Navy that will take a paper cartridge um, without being modified. And so I just didn't feel like modifying my guns. And as a big a pain in the butt as it was for me to make them little paper cartridges, I just got fed up with it. And I feel bad because Dustin, I don't know if Dustin's still watching, but Dustin sent me some um, paper cartridges, uh, formers in exchange for a holster. And they're still sitting in the envelope. I've never opened them because I just, I just cannot make those little paper cartridges. I just, I get so frustrated with it so fast. Um, enthusiast if I've ever tried the TSS loads. No, I haven't. I just use, um, I don't even know if I got any here on the table. I know I've got some in my coat pocket because I found them in my Jeep when I was cleaning them out earlier today. I use the Remington three inch number four buffered turkey load magnum. And through my shotgun with my full waterfowl choke, that thing prints a beautiful pattern. I mean, I can pretty much cut a turkey's head off out to 30 yards with it and that ticks my grandmother off so much when i shoot them in the neck because she can't get that neck she loves to cook turkey neck for whatever reason she uh gets so mad at me because i don't keep the neck but you know when i skin the bird out you know there's like a big wad of the neck right there it's just nothing but hamburger and lead shots like i'm not gonna serve that up for us to eat so that little bitty piece of not a lot of meat i'm throwing away um but yeah i've heard the tss loads are excellent um oh garrett wood sign night garrett um yeah casey's got that's giblet gravy yeah no kidding um Yeah, I've heard heard lots of good things about the TSS loads, but when I've seen them in the store, they're so much more spendy than the uh, um, regular. Uh, they're so much more spendy than just the regular hunting loads. And I bought two boxes, two 10 round boxes of that stuff, and I've only fired. See, I shot one one turkey dad shot a turkey with the other one then i shot my turkey at spring so i fired three rounds there's three rounds that's been fired oh no i take it back because i shot at dad's turkey um when we was turkey hunting last year so i wasted one shell on a miss um because i've told this story before last year when i shot my turkey there was two turkeys come in together two toms but yeah uh, Young Tom had fairly decent sized beard and a younger Tom that would have been borderline Jake. Uh, well, he was goblin. So yeah, he, he'd be a Tom. Anyway, uh, they came in together and I told dad, you know, we shoot on three. I shot dad was a little bit behind and dad's bird dropped. So what I was seeing when I shot, I lined up on my bird. I shot dad shot right behind me. I seen both birds go down, mine started flitting, and then dad's bird got up, 
started to walk away. His shotgun was jammed and he said, I can't get it to rack. And I swung over and I took a shot, but at the time I swung over and took a shot, he'd walk right behind a stump it was there. So I hit the stump. Um, otherwise dad would have got his bird too. And I thought I had, cause I seen the Turkey flinch when I shot. So I thought, well, I got some shot, some pellets into him. And I was certain I hit him in the neck. And he wasn't going to go very far because dad could see him. He went one behind, behind that stump. I couldn't see him. Dad seen him, and dad said, he's not moving fast. He's he's moving real slow and wobbling. So I thought between the two of us, we killed him. We got up there, and we I followed his tracks through that soft dirt, clear up to the gate at the neighbor's, and he hit that gate. There were the property boundary ends, and then went up the fence line of the neighbor's, and he was hell bent for the election by the time he was running. By the time he got there, you could tell by the way his tracks were. So we didn't hit. Him. If we did hit him, we didn't hit him hard. But yeah, that that Remington, I think it's a nitro, is what it is. That Remington nitro turkey load. I absolutely love it, and it kicks more than the um my waterfowl loads. That's for sure, but. You get a good hit on it, it only takes one shot. I've got some tungsten. Um, I bought some of that heavy hammer tungsten um, for geese this year. Um, There's one thing we noticed that the year before when we was waterfowl hunting with the geese is that that damn steel shot. He hit one goose four or five times that steel shot. He might break a wing, but if he gets in the water, he's swimming faster than you can get to him. Um, and we, the geese that we shot, we sh Dad and I shot three geese a piece, and we only recovered four. Uh, two of them got away on us. So I told Dad, I said, that ain't going to work no more. And I don't know how many geese I shot at that were well within range. And I always tried to hit aim for the head, but I don't know if I wasn't leading enough or what. But you shoot them, and you rock them, and they fly away. And I told Dad, I said, I can't stand that. So I bought the tungsten this year and I told dad, I said, if I see geese or if we go specifically for geese, I'm throwing that tungsten in. I'm half tempted to use it on turkey, but as expensive as it is, I don't know, not that much more expensive than my turkey load, but I don't know if I want to save just save that for the geese or if I want to try that this year for the turkey just to see how it does. But I've got two tags, so I think one of my turkeys I'm going to try to take with my bow. I haven't shot anything with my bow yet. But it's funny, and if I go this year, if I get two turkeys and if I have the bow, then I can shoot one turkey, and then maybe the other one will stick around long enough for Dad to shoot his with a shotgun. Yeah, six sixty five construction choke Mufuzi. That worked pretty good, but yeah, I I don't remember what my waterfowl choke is. So when I was we started waterfowl hunting, I bought that new semi auto, and I bought a couple chokes for it. I got a uh, modified, and then I got a full, and that full on that thing with anything I put through it, it shoots a really good group. I was knocking pigeons down. Uh, using seven and a half and eight shot, I was knocking down pigeons at 80 yards with that thing because I just shoot at the damn pigeons just to shoot at them. Shoot them at 80 yards and they drop. Um, of course, you got to lead them by like that. Um, and with that turkey load, it shoots real good. But I've got a pump action Winchester, and that was what I used to kill my first turkey with. And I kind of, well, the reason I leaned away from it. Cause that's what I used to shoot my first ducks with as well. Um, reason I was leading away from that is cause that thing shooting that low, you know, at 20 yards and I never could hit anything with it. But I got an extra, extra full choke for it when I was shooting for waterfowl. Cause I thought, yeah, if I tighten that choke up pattern up, you know, them ducks that I hit that, you know, fly off when I hit them at 35 yards, you know, maybe it might knock them down. Well, apparently there's a kind of a, a point when you start constricting down steel shot that it starts to spread out again. Because I took that shotgun and I patterned it. I put the modified in and I 
you know, 20 yards, it was shooting a group like this. I put the full in, tightened it down like that. And then I put that extra, extra full in and it went crazy. So apparently you get too much constriction on it. But I told dad, I said, you know what? I said, I ought to try that with that turkey load and see how tight it is. The only problem is it shoots the dad down low. You know, I'm afraid if I aim at the turkey's head, I'm going to hit him right in the breast. And as tight as that would shoot with a lead buffer shot, I imagine it. 35 yards is still going to be a pretty tight pattern like that. Yeah, and if was, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Them, I've got the tungsten load I've got is number two. And I think the TSS loads are like a mixture of seven and a half and nine. So it's a lot smaller shot. I imagine with a number two shot, I could probably drop a turkey at that distance, maybe a little further. Um, somebody told me that they had dropped a goose at 120 yards with that tungsten number two. And number two is the biggest shot you can use for turkey in Colorado. Yeah, where I'm at, we got a lot of crows, but they're smart too. Every time I try to call a crow in, they turn around and go the other way. I told dad because the crows this year, oh my God. So when we go duck hunting, we always see a few crows, uh, depending on where we're at. There's a couple of small little water holes that, you know, we see, you'll see 10, 15 geese, 15, 20 ducks on it um, coming and going. And, but there's always crows there because there's a dump not far away. This year, my God, the crows were ridiculous. And I told Dad, I said, you know, when crows come in, we'll shoot them. And the thing is, in Colorado, you can use an electronic for, call for crows. So I started playing a crow call on my, sound, on my phone. Apparently, them crows have been shot at before because as soon as you start playing a crow sound and they're only, you know, maybe 50, 60 yards out, they're gone. But I got a hold of the dump down there and I asked him, I said, hey, I said, uh, do you care if I come in and shoot them crows? And they said, we're closed on Sundays. He said, come in and shoot all the damn crows you want. But my grandmother said, I ain't eating no crow that's been eaten out of a dump. So we didn't shoot any crows. Well, Nafuzi, I tell you what, if I had number four, um, number four lead shot for crows, uh, not the expensive number four lead shot, but if I had some number fours, some stouter number fours, I would try a shot at a crow at 50, 60 yards. Like I said, that shotgun knocks down pigeons with eight shot at, you know, 75, 80. I don't remember what the long, I can't remember now what the longest shot I was, but I know I was knocking pigeons down a lot further out than what the boss thought I could do. And uh, I would try that on a crow. <laughs> what was funny is, so I, when I, we first started duck hunting, I thought I'd use number twos for the ducks. And, uh, this was before I really realized how low the shotgun was shooting. And that was shotgun part of it. The other part was me not shooting birds a lot at the time. Um, I had bought these Winchester. No, I take that back as federal loses Fred, federal BB loads. As I thought, yeah, I didn't knock anything down on number two. I'm going to go to a BB. And these rounds, Looked like they had had super glue on top of them to waterproof them. The second duck I shot, so we had a bunch of shovelers come in. That was the first ducks that come in on our decoy spread. Dad shot one. I thought I shot three, but there was only two that fell. The second one I shot, I went and picked up, and it had a hole that big around through the one breast. And no other pellets anywhere on that bird. Just one gigantic hole right through the middle of it. And I told my dad, I was like, God damn. I said, did I hit him with a wad? Well, I got my curiosity up. So I come home and uh, I took one of those shells and I cut it open. Went to dump the shot out. The shot didn't come out. So I kind of wiggled it there. And pretty soon the whole wad come out. They had glued the ends of them. They dumped super glue on them to waterproof them. And it had gone down and had glued all the BBs together. So I basically shot it with a slug. <laughs> but yeah, I remember 
went over and picked up that duck, and I looked at that, and I picked it up, and I held it towards Dad. And I said, look at that. And I could look through that hole and see Dad over there. I mean, it was a big hole. And Dad said, oh, it looks like it's a little bit chawed. Maybe I'll let him get out there a little further. The other duck I'd shot, the, the pellets had come open. And I had hit it. Yeah, I mean, pretty much dinner took its head off. You know, most of its head was gone from pellets hitting it. And it had a couple pellets in around here. So I know it was the pellets had spread out on it. But that freaking second one I shot. And what's really funny is my dad, with his 20 gauge, he can shoot a duck in the head. He has not shot a duck yet that we've had any of the shot in the body. I've had several ducks where I've had shot all over them, but his ducks, none of them have any shot. They're always head shots or wing shots. He gets head and wing shots. We can go rabbit and squirrel hunting. And you'll have a squirrel up in a tree, 40 yards up in a tree, and he will shoot, and that squirrel will fall, and he's got no head. You take it home, there's not a pellet in his body. He'll shoot a rabbit. Pick it up, bring it home, clean it. Head's gone, or it's got a lot of pellets in the head, depending on how far it is, but never a shot in the body. My dad can shoot just about anything in the head he shoots at, with the exception of does. He doesn't do very good well on does. But you stick a damn turkey out there whose head is equivalent to the size of a head of a small rabbit or a squirrel. Out at 20 yards, he can't hit that damn bird to save his life. <laughs> I don't know what it is. But, uh, yeah, we give my dad a lot of crap because, yeah, he missed two turkeys last year. Hopefully he shoots one this year, but yeah, he didn't get a turkey last year. Not from lack of trying. He shot it too, but he shot twice at one, once at another. But, yeah, I have went 15 minutes past when I said I was going to shut this down. So, that being said, I'll give it another four minutes here and then we're going to call it good. Yeah, Nafuzi, I think they call that a poor man slug or a version of a poor man slug. I tried shooting a poor man slug one time. Um, and it just, it, it, I didn't cut the shell off. I, I left too much meat and it, it just come out normal. But uh, I know a, of a guy and I'm not going to say any names, but he decided to go deer hunting and he deer hunts with a shotgun. And he screwed up and bought the wrong kind of ammo. He brought the wrong kind of ammo with him. And Bangs, he was on private land. I mean, you know, in this particular area that he was hunting, you know, game wardens are not known to be around because it's in the middle of freaking nowhere. He took one of those said shells and cut a poor man's slug, and he shot a deer with it about 15 yards. And I helped him clean that deer out. And I tell you what, you want to drop a deer in his tracks because that thing is one hole in, you know, about 12 gauge size going in. Once it hits on the inside, freaking lungs were destroyed. The heart was destroyed. I mean, them things are uh, potent. But the thing was, he couldn't save any of the meat at all around the rib cage because, I mean, that. Once that shot dispersed inside that deer's rib cage, you know, there was shot everywhere. I think he wound up taking just a little bit of meat off the shoulders. Well, he was able to save the front quarters, the back quarters, the back straps. He couldn't take the uh, tenderloins out because they were filled with shot. I mean, that shell just exploded inside that deer. Needless to say, after that, he always made sure that he had the right type of ammo for his shotgun when he went hunting. All right. We'll give it a couple more minutes here. And YouTube says there's still 12 of you watching. And StreamYard says there's 15 of you, so... Yeah, Fousey, I just, 
I don't shotgun be all right for your uh, home defense, but I don't know. I just uh, I've got one that I have more of as a backup, but I don't know shotgun and me for home defense. I just it it doesn't fit what I um it doesn't fit my style. Just put it that way. And I found out this little shorter barreled one that I've got. Um, if you use birdshot for home defense, you might as well just throw the shell at them because we shot at uh, a uh, milk jug at about 15 paces with that, with seven and a half and eight shot. And the pellets are just barely breaking through the milk jug. I think the wad was doing more damage to the milk jug than the pellets were. Now, granted, you put double lot buckshot or, or number four buckshot load that I've got through it, it'll wallop you. <laughs> It was funny as I was out training with that one day when I was trying to get a feel for it when I was first doing it. And I had been practicing with uh, my semi auto rifle as well. You know, it's kind of transitioning, going from I shoot the main gun, transition to the pistol. And then I did a drill where I, I did quite a few drills that day where, you know, go from pistol to transfer to the main gun. Uh, now I'm going to use a shotgun. Last thing I do for the day before I go home. And, you know, I've got this shorter Mossberg shotgun, um, shockwave. And uh, I load up the really stout number four buckshot in it. And I go to do my drill, I draw my pistol, I fire it, empty, holster it, grab that shotgun and I pulled it up. And instead of holding it out like this, like you're supposed to do, I'm still in the mentality of bring it to the shoulder and pull. I bring my hand up here to position it on my face and I go kabam and that's it's bit me in the face my god my jaw was sore for about a week because that grip on that thing come back and it just punched me right there in the jaw and I've had a problem before when I had my wisdom tooth pulled out the dentist pushed so hard on my jaw when he was pulling that SOB that it popped out of the socket and I had spent you know I had been probably four years of having that thing pop out when I was chewing, you know, and when it popped out, it was pretty damn painful. I couldn't open my jaw very far. Couldn't hardly talk. Or when I get to talking when I was at work giving tours, you know, it'd pop out in the middle of when I was talking. So I'm sitting there holding my jaw and trying to talk at the same time. Well, by the time I get this shotgun is about when this thing's starting to get itself healed up and it's not doing it near as bad. That thing hit me on my jaw. It screwed it back up for another three months. But it's kind of back to normal now. Every once in a while when I'm chewing on something, especially if I'm chewing on something that's a little bit on the harder side, it'll pop out, but usually goes back into place pretty quick. But I got to say, the dentist that I went that did that, he didn't want to pull that tooth. I made him do it because I told him I didn't want to go to a specialist. I just wanted the SOB out because it, was, it impacted, it was infected, and was giving me all kinds of hellacious problems. It was a wisdom tooth that needed to come out anyway. And he said, all right. He says, I'll take it out. Because I told him, I said, I don't, I'm in college. I don't have the money to do it. And he said, well, you know, he says, it wasn't that long ago I was in college. He said, I really don't want to do it, but I'll go ahead. But that thing was stuck in there so damn tight because, you know, the, the bottoms of that wisdom tooth had hooked. And what he did was when he tried to get it, he put his knee on my forehead, put his hand here, pushed down. And when he did, that's when he popped it out of there. But that dentist treated me very nice afterwards because I had a couple cavities that he filled for me and he gave me a pretty steep discount on what it would have cost me. It would have been one of the cavities I had. It would have been about $600 worth of repair work. Um, and he discounted it pretty daggum steep. So I can't hold that against him. He was heart was in the right place. And I kind of pushed him into to doing that procedure. But he straight up told me, he said, this one over here is going to have to come out. But he said, I ain't even going to touch it. And he said, don't even ask me to touch it. And he says, I don't want to deal with it because this one over here hasn't emerged yet. One of these days it's going to come out too, but it hasn't been giving me any problems. So I'm just living with it. Now that I've gone on about my health problems. <laughs> Must be getting late because I'm starting to ramble and I've already missed my mark again by four minutes. So what the hell? We'll run it till 11 o'clock. Yeah.
make it a three or almost a three hour live chat. What the hell? So, yeah, if you got any last minute questions, throw them up there. Otherwise, I might end it a couple minutes earlier than 11 o'clock. Yeah, I uh, I got one at the time because I wanted a, a shotgun that I could carry in the car. And, you know, I got it. I really, once I bought it, I really was not fond of that grip because it felt real slick in my hand. So one of the first modifications I did to it is I got this rubber overmold grip that you slide onto it. 100% difference. I mean, really, really made a big difference in the grip on that shotgun. Um then I, uh, next thing I did is I put one of those uh, racks on the side that holds six ammo, six rounds of ammo. Um, and then I bought a sling for it, which has since migrated to my hunting shotgun because I really love that sling. I love that sling. Oh my God, I love it. Anyway, um, I got to looking into, uh, um, you know, a brace on it. I've seen some guys that run them braces with a pistol grip because one of the things that it has to have that style of uh, grip on it to meet the certain legal definition, whatever. But then somebody told me up in South Dakota is like, yeah, if you put these pistol grip or the, the brace on it, you can put a pistol grip on it. And he said it doesn't change anything because, you know, the overall length of that pistol grip before it goes to the buffer tube on it meets the minimum requirement. So I was thinking about buying one of them and then somebody told me that uh, somebody had put one of those on there and then got in trouble. So I said, you know what? I don't think it's worth it. I'll just keep it the way it is. It's just a learning curve. You just got to remember to stick that thing out there as far as your arms will let you. Always keep your hand inside of the uh, wrap that is on the, the, the uh, pump, the slide. And you know, that'll give you a lot of bracing on it too. And don't be running freaking three inch magnums. I ran a three inch magnum through that SOB and that will freaking buck that gun up in your face so fast. I only put one in there. I just wanted to see how it would work. And yeah, do not run a three inch mag through the shockwave. Yeah, Infusi, if I was to do that again, I would get the 20 gauge, but you know, I had to be a sadist and get the 12. Somebody I knew had a 410 on that, but I'm like, why would I mess with a 410 shotgun for that kind? I would rather have the 12. That and I could put the mini, mini uh, shells in there and I could run a lot more of those, run a lot more shells to it. Yeah, on the Fuzzy, they got a 410, they got a 20, and a 12. And then I was going to, I thought about trading it in and going for one that was uh, a Remington. Oh, I can't remember what model. It was a semi-auto Remington that they was offering at the time. And then somebody told me that the ATF didn't approve them. You had to do them as a short barrel shotgun because uh, the semi-auto didn't meet the two-handed definition. It could be fired one hand, which made it a pistol, which short barrel, shotgun, all that legal. Oh, my God, 10-gauge? Jesus. That would, I would not want to shoot a 10-gauge in that configuration. No way in hell. Ain't going to happen. But, yeah, they was. I was going to get one of those semi-autos, and I thought, nah, I'm not going to go that route. Not after what that one guy told me because they said something about the Mossberg shockwave definition is that bangs it is whatever length but still has to be operated with two hands because you gotta you gotta operate with two hands you gotta run that pump with that one hand so it's got to be two-hand operation that's how they was able to get through the definition but the semi-auto you can operate with one hand which makes it a handgun You know, the only way I would shoot a 10 gauge is if I could find one uh, pump action or semi-auto that had a 28 inch or longer barrel on it. In which case, then I would buy one, but it would be for hunting purposes. 
I almost bought a 10 gauge H and R partner one time. And then I remembered how much the 12 gauge kicked. And I'm like, you know what? I don't think I'm going to go with a 10 gauge three and a half inch. No way. Speaking of longer barrels than 28, um, I don't know when it's kind of late to bring it up now in the chat because we're getting close to the end here, but, uh, has anybody out there and you can comment down in the comment section too. Has anybody ever tried those extended, um, barrel extenders that you screw into your, um, into your shotgun and it extends it out. I was talking with a guy that makes them and sells them on eBay. And he said, you know, a lot of guys out in California that he knows shoots them, uh, for duck hunting and the way they're set up, if you get the four inch, I think four inch is the largest that he makes. You can get the four inch tube extension, screw that in. Then if you get a two inch, um, uh, choke extended choke you know you can take a 28 inch barrel and take it clear out to 46 inches or 40, excuse me 36 inches I thought about trying that but i just i don't know if i want to buy them and then find out that they're crap and tear up my gun but yeah anybody that, that watches this afterwards if you've got an answer to that uh, let me know how they work down in that comment section below and we've hit 11 o'clock so um I think it's about time to shut it down here. So, um, yeah, and if I understand you, yeah, my wish list is I'd have to win the lottery to make my wish list because right now it's on my wish list is a 66 Winchester, um, uh, number three, first model American from Cimarron. And I've been thinking about a five and a half inch single action army, uh, five and a half inch barrel. I've got the four and three quarter. I got the seven and a half. I was thinking about getting the five and a half in between. And the 72 open top, I um, think I'd want to go with one in 45 Colt, though. Um, the seven and a half inch or eight inch barrel, depending on if it was the Army or the Navy model. And the Cimarron Richards conversion that's got the slot for the, uh, the old loading lever system still in it. That would be a fun one. Um, the number two Richards Mason, I think is what they call it. I got a long wish list uh, eventually. Yeah. And then uh, another Wells Fargo, uh, 62 pocket Navy. I've got the 62 mm -hmm. police and, uh, yeah, that's all I've got on the wish list for right now. Eventually 73 single or 73 Winchester. Oh, trapdoor Springfield and a Spencer carbine is also on that list. Spencer carbine to come before the 73 and the trapdoor. Although if I could find a trap door at a reasonable price, I might get that first. But yeah, I've, I've got a long, long wait list or wish list. I should say not wait list, wish list. One that's probably not going to be filled anytime soon. Like I said, unless I win the lottery or somebody dies and wills me a bunch of money. So, all right. Yeah, looks like the chat's pretty well died out. So we're going to sign off here. I want to thank everybody that's joined in and watched. Thanks for those that are, that are still watching there. The comments have kind of dried up, but uh, it's been fun. Maybe next week I'll have something a little more exciting to show. Um, I didn't have much to show tonight. Uh, but, yeah, glad to have you all on. Um, we'll uh, try to do this uh, next week. Like I said, um, this may be the last one in March. I don't know. Uh, like I said in the title there, I might do one next Tuesday. Um, probably figure though next Thursday for sure, which I think is April Fool's Day. So maybe that's not a good day to do it. Um, and hopefully by the time I get the next chat in, I will have my leather in and we'll have another model holster for the Schofield available. I might have some more holsters. It'll be just to put up on Etsy. Um, but yeah, if uh, you want to look up any holster or if you want to get some reviews from people that have bought my holsters, uh, 11 Bang Bang Channel did a review not too long ago on the Schofield model. Um, Squib Load, I don't know if his has went live yet uh, as he sent me a, a link to it to, uh, before uh, before he's uh, published it just kind of for me to review. Um, but he's got or will have one uh, listed over there. Um, does a review on the Walker flap holster and the uh, Bohannon holster. 
And I think that's currently all the videos I've got on, on reviews on my holsters. But yeah, go over and check them out and, and they can kind of tell you, show you what you kind of get, what to expect. Um, but anyway, yeah, if you need to order, the uh, email's there. I'll try to remember to drop it down. I think I've got it down in the description box. Check out the Etsy store. Um, and uh, I think we're going to sign off for there. So we'll catch you hopefully next week. Y'all take care and keep your powder dry. Okay, I clicked in broadcast, so why is it?